Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the April 2nd meeting of the Board of Selectmen. First, we have a public hearing pursuant to RSA 4114A Proceedings First Hearing. 295 Ocean Boulevard, tax map 234, lot 3, off Winnicott Road, Spring Marsh. Flyport Realty, LLC, pursuant to RSA 4114A, requesting the purchase or lease of town-owned parcel behind Flyport's property at 595 Ocean Boulevard. It is Flyport intent to construct a commercial building and it hopes to utilize the subject lot for access and or parking as it has been utilized historically by the former Lupo's restaurant. Is there anybody from the public that wants to speak on this first public hearing? Oh. Yeah, come up and state your name, please. Bill Lally, Edgewood Drive, Hampton. I'm here to speak in favor of this. Um, as Mr. Griffin knows, I was on the Board of Selectmen when this <laughs> first came up, when uh, the Lupo, uh, Lupo had this property. And back then I had my, uh, had a thing about my memory today about how we went about this. And that Lupo had started using that land on his own without consulting the town. He had a big st uh, food storage locker out back. He had a deck that people used out back. Uh, he also had a shed that was all on town property back there. As you know, there's not a lot of space. Now, the properties adjacent to that building and the building next to it seem to have more space out back, more land for their, their properties. We took a vote, and I remember Mark Gerald drew up the paperwork to lease the, the space to Lupo so he could use it legally because for years it was used illegally. I believe a, the selectman vote, if I remember, was a five nothing vote, and we allowed him to do that. We charged him whatever it was. It, was. it wasn't a lot of money, but we charged him to lease the land. This, this property, as you know, for many years, and Rusty, you know, you know of anybody else and Ricky down there, it needs to be developed. I mean, it's an eyesore. Uh, the, the person that owns it now, and uh, is, just to be completely honest about this, uh, I've known the fellow for 30 years. He wants to develop that, that land. I think this would be helpful to the town and obviously to him to get this project underway. It's sat there now for a long time. I think he's ready to go. I think he needs the selectman's approval. And as you all know, any new project or business in the town, I think we all want to see that happen. So again, I don't know where, I know I watched the planning board meeting and, and the uh, conservation commission had issues with it. But back then, and Rick, you might be remember, I don't remember the conservation commission having a problem with it then when we leased that to Lupo. You might remember it. I don't, I don't have the minutes of those meetings. But um, I just think it would be a, a, a plus for the town, for the developer, and get that area cleaned up and taken care of. And also, just one more thing. The tax map, 234, Lot 3, and it says it's off Winter County Road, the Spring Marsh. Well, technically, years and years ago it was, but there is that landlocked. There's no, you cannot get into that property from Winter County Road. That can only be accessed from that driveway to the extreme left of that property. So that's kind of a misnomer. I know it says it on the map, and it, it, years ago it probably was true, but right now that uh, it doesn't work. So thank you very much for your time. Anybody else on the public hearing? Could I ask? No, no. no. Jerry's on all here 16 presidential. I sat with Rick and, and Bill on that uh, discussion about loopholes. And you know, they, we did lease it, end up leasing it, but there was a discussion, as I recall, in some agreement with the Conservation Commission, so not to get into the marsh areas. We had a setback, I don't know how many feet we had to, to you know, uh, be mindful of before we could actually pave it or anything. I know the Conservation Commission uh, agreed in the final, fi the finality of the whole thing, but 
that was the only concern we had was just how, how much are we encroaching on the wet, west, wetlands if we are and what kind of a setback we would need uh, to safeguard the marshes. And that's what I think we have to be mindful of. And I don't remember the agreement, but that's what happened. Anybody else in the public hearing want to speak? Uh, Ray Ann Dione, I'm the Hampton Conservation Coordinator. So I'm here to just give you a brief overview of the Conservation Commission's involvement and um, position regarding selling or leasing land in the Wetland Conservation District. The Wetland Conservation District is um, any wetland area, area of poorly or very poorly drained soils, and then a 50 feet landward from that edge. Um, this parcel that's um, located behind um, 595 Ocean Boulevard was obtained by the town in 2008 by tax lien. Uh, the Conservation Commission uh, began reviewing this type of request back in 2009, again in 2013, and now we're looking at it again 2017-18. In each of those reviews, the Commission was unanimously opposed to selling or leasing um, land in the Wetland Conservation District. Um, it's important to note now there was a, the previous lease was based, um, the last lease was in 2011. It was based on a delineation that was done in 2010. Uh, that delineation um, was redone uh, in 2017. And if you look at the current plan and if you have, happen to have a copy, I know it was part of our larger packet of what was leased in 2011, you will notice that there were five parking spaces that were leased and they were located on the north, um, kind of west, well, on the north side of the parcel, adjacent to 595 Ocean Boulevard. When that area was uh, revisited um, in 2017, the area where those five parking spaces were leased has now transitioned into a wetland area. Um, they have subsequently shifted those parking spaces to the south um, that area is still within the Wetland Conservation District. Actually, um, the Wetland Conservation District encompasses about three quarters of 595 Ocean Boulevard as well. Um, if you look at the new proposed plan, you will see that to create those four parking spaces that they're requesting, they are going to need to bring in over four feet of fill to um, achieve that. Um, so I think it's important to kind of see how that property has been changing uh, in the 10 years that the town has owned it. Um, the second thing that I think is um, uh, worth noting, um, you know, we've been observing the parcel. It does um, get inundated with water that at tides that are nine feet or higher. Um, in 2018, we are expected to have 216 days, basically two-thirds of the year, where that back parcel is going to have water um, over it, um, which is probably why they're proposing that four feet of fill to get whatever vehicles are in that area outside or elevated enough. Um, keep in mind, too, that the addition of fill, this salt marsh that it backs up to is a New Hampshire DES prime wetland. Um, it's noted for uh, its uh, large, uh, one of the largest salt marsh uh, complexes in New Hampshire for wildlife, habitat. Um, it's a very important area. So any work that occurs um, within 100 feet of a prime wetland uh, requires a DES permit. That's something that the Conservation Commission um, reviews. It also requires, because it's within 50 feet, uh, it requires our town wetlands permit. So the proposed fill of over four feet um, is not something that the Commission is likely to support, either at our town permit level or at the state level. The last thing I'd like to point out is they have commented that they want to use a commercial use. This property is located in the business seasonal zone. There is no requirement in the business seasonal zone to have off-street parking. So for the use that they're proposing for this building, they do not need any off-street parking. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public? <laughs> Good evening, Jason Bashan, Town Planner. I just wanted to note that the Planning Board also did not recommend this request. Um, they cited the uh, Conservation Commission's letter, which uh, Rayanne uh, cited very well uh, for you this evening, um, as the reasons for not. 
Um, also, the idea that um, being proposed here is a commercial building um, south of First Street. Um, if you're not providing sleeping quarters, you don't need to provide parking for commercial use. That's in the zoning ordinance. So there still is an opportunity for the applicant to propose a commercial building for the 595 Ocean Parcel without using that for parking. But I just wanted to note that um, the reasons that the uh, Planning Board did not recommend as well, citing the <coughs> Conservation Commission's letter. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jay Diener, also the Conservation Commission. Um, there's a couple of issues that I want to point out, but the first one is that I just want to remind the board that this property can still be developed if the back portion is not sold or leased. That doesn't prevent the owner from developing the main portion of the 595 Ocean Boulevard lot. There is already um, development that occurred there, uh, so development would be permitted um, I believe by the the boards depending of course on the specifics of it um, regardless of what happens to the back of the parcel so denying this sale or lease does not categorically prohibit development of the front portion of the parcel um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is is the fact that Hampton seems to have a flooding problem um, since in the last five months, we've had uh, a king tide in November that pr produced huge amount of water on all of our streets off Ashworth Avenue, all around the salt marsh. <coughs> we had a huge storm on January 4th that sent icebergs floating down our streets at Hampton Beach. And I'm sure you're all very familiar, too familiar, with the storm that we just had on March 2nd um, that resulted in massive flooding along the salt marsh with also tremendous splash over from the ocean side. So we got hit from both sides on that storm. We are, Rayanne pointed out the number of tides that we're expecting at nine feet over the course of this year. We're also expecting, we're, we're predicted to have 49 high tides at 10 feet or higher during the course of 2018. Every 10 foot or higher high tide is resulting in street flood flooding and property flooding off Ash Ashworth Avenue and some of the other streets mm -hmm. that are adjacent to the salt marsh. So we're being impacted tremendously by rising seas and by storm surges. One thing that helps to protect us is our salt marsh. Um, in addition to the benefits that it provides us as far as aquatic life is concerned, uh, helping to keep our water clean, it's, it's peat, it's a giant sponge. So it helps to absorb some of these floodwaters, some of these storm surges that we get so that the damage to our town infrastructure and to our residential properties is not as bad as it might be. Every time we permit development adjacent to or, or in our salt marsh or our wetlands conservation district, we're eating away at some of those protections. And I think we're at a point in time where we're coming to the realization that we just can't afford to do that anymore. Um, the marsh ideally should be able to migrate so it can expand. So as the tide, tides rise, we will still have more marsh as it moves along. And in fact, we're seeing some indications of marsh migration over on Drake's, Drakeside Road where high marsh is evolving into low marsh, which is gonna make it more absorbent. So those are good things. Bad things are development that occurs adjacent to the marsh um, because it, it creates, if you will, a wall that prevents that marsh from migrating, that stops that marsh from doing the job that we really need it to do. So I, I, I urge you to use your good judgment and to, if you will, draw a line in the marsh and say we're at a point in Hampton where the consequences that we're seeing as a result of rising seas and increasing storms, storm activity tells us that we cannot permit the kind of development that we once did, that we could once do and, and not incur the same kind of damage. We're just not there anymore. So we, have to, we have to take into account what's happening to our town, what's happening to our environment, and let that play a significant role in the decisions that we make going forward. Thank you. Go ahead. 
Charlie Preston, 47 Glade Path. Anybody wants to talk flooding, I got to, I'm fairly in tune with it. Mr. Chairman, I know there's probably nobody more in this room that knows this person parcel because you grew up next door. Yep. Um, I know when it was Lupo's, I used to park out back. Um, before that, I think there was a guy from Manchester, very nice couple that had a clam business there. They were really nice people. I think they were out of Manchester. So it's been a commercial establishment for years. Jay's right on the flooding. But I also see the business part of this too. You know, and I see a piece of property that's assessed for 340 and there's a past history of leasing this. You know, that, that should be considered also. And when it comes to the flooding, the way I see it, we have two choices. You can raise the elevation or you can retreat. And this is going to be coming forward. I came in here for an abatement about five years ago. Someone could look it up and see exactly when it was. I was denied. And I came in based it. Every piece of my property went underwater. And every piece of my property at 47 Glade Path, I own 1.41 acres, of which 90% of it is marsh. But the little piece that I have left the high, I have water around my foundation on all four sides touching it. I can't get down the street to my house. So this isn't going to be just an issue on this property. It's going to be it's going to be town wide. So there has to you know you're going to have to decide, you know what's going to happen here because it, you're going to be you're going to be getting it a lot. I recently saw a, a book the other night that they were doing a story on, and people should look at it. The name of the book is "The Water Will Come," and the author is Jeff Goodell, like Roger Goodell, and. And, and, and he, the way it's talked about, I mean, he's talking about it from a town point where the value of these properties are going to be going down. So I see it that, you know, in these, some of these cases, you're going to need to allow people to raise the elevation or you're going to have to retreat. And even if you did lease this property to him, and I, I, I'm not that involved, I haven't been that involved in this, uh, this property, but... If you lease a man the property or something like that, you know, maybe at some point they should say, you know, when the tides are up, people don't park in it or something because repetitive losses we don't need at any level. I don't care if it's a car or if it's a, if it's a, if it's a building or whatever it is. We need to stop it. Repetitive losses are everywhere. And bottom line is they're costing us all. But I, I don't see the harm in leasing this property. And the elevation is something you're going to have to decide, but that's the only thing. That's the future. Because you're going to be having people coming in. Like I said, I came in for the abatement based on my property goes underwater. <coughs> Thank you. Next. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, Barbara Renault, also of the Conservation Commission. Uh, just a couple of little points, uh, additional points to, for your consideration. Uh, that haven't been brought up yet. Um, in the letters of opposition since 2009 that we've written with regard to sale or lease of um, wetland conservation district land, we have asked that that land be returned to its natural vegetative state in each of those cases, each of those letters, and specifically to the letters on this property. Um, that has not occurred, but Apparently, the, the marsh wants its own way and has been trying to reclaim uh, that land anyway. Um, that's one thing. Another is that uh, people think in terms of tax revenue and the benefit of business, and of course that's good, but it, if you've noticed, one of the slides that we have on Channel 22 uh, speaks to studies that have been done that indicate that for every dollar of tax revenue that you receive, for developed land, it costs roughly, depending on which study you look at, a dollar and a quarter in support services with fire, police, public works, uh, and, and all of those issues. And for undeveloped land, for every dollar, you receive less revenue, but for every dollar of revenue, it costs about 90 cents for support services. So the, that's, it's sort of, tax revenue is sort of deceptive in, in, in that regard, because there are services that are going to have to be provided. Um, and I think we've covered just about everything else. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak on this public hearing? Hi, Anthony Caro. I am also on the Conservation Committee. Uh, I am not in favor of filling in the wetlands on the former Lupo's property. 
it may seem like a small little patch of land, like a small, it's just a little insignificant piece of wetlands, but if you added all little piece of wetlands that get filled in, I think it's kind of like if you had a small hand ax and you just kept chipping away at a tree, eventually over time, that tree is just gonna die. And that's why I feel we should protect all our wetlands. It's, you know, I'm gonna quote Ray and she, she says, you know, we, all, we keep all our wetlands, they're all e equal to us. One isn't worth less than the other. So they're all equal. And so isn't that little piece of land. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak on this public hearing? Anybody else? I'll bring it back to the board. Mary Louise. That was great participation, and I appreciate it. We do have the maps. Is there any? Let's see. Is the current owner of the property uh, paying taxes? I would assume so. Uh, no, the town owns the property. I'm sorry? The town owns the property that's being discussed it, right now. Right. Well, the the back lot or it's the whole owned lot? by the town. Okay. The back, correct. So we the back own lot the town. We own the property. <clears throat> the property that is in front is the one that this group owns. Right. And they're paying taxes, I would assume. Right. That's what I'm trying to get at. In a case like this, where it appears to be um, not a smart move to allow construction in the wetlands, is there some kind of co consideration or something that the, the uh, current owners might, might uh, receive some compensation for a lot that's basically unbuildable? Well, it's not unbuildable. I mean, there was a building there before, and he can build back to the footprint. Uh, yeah, that's correct. So I don't. <clears throat> saying it's not buildable. Well, in light of the way the, the water problems are going, uh, we're probably getting close. Uh, I think th that's all I have for the moment. This hearing's only about the back lot. That's right. What? The hearing's, hearing's about only the about the back, back lot. lot. The lot behind it. Yes. Yeah, it's not about the front lawn. Jim, okay. you think? Okay. I see yeah, I, I was on the planning board and, and listened to the Conservation Commission and everything, and I, and, and I think what Jay said is a really valid point, that, that it, every time we change the marsh, mm -hmm. we make something else happen some other place. And last year we had how many people come in here about flooding issues, oh, and yeah. flooding issues where there were buildings in the marsh, or there were changes in the marsh. Yeah. And we're now spending a lot of money on a study yeah. to help us with the flooding and when it, you know so I, I, I agree with Jay, what Jay said exactly is is that you know if you change the marsh you're going to be in trouble and this building can still be developed this commercial property can still be developed it still can be a business so so I would be opposed to it Rick yeah I was here <clears throat> at the board before when this um, uh, was the board decided to lease it to Lupo's and <clears throat> how they decided to lease it to Lupo's was, uh, I don't know, what was it, around $1,500 or $1,300, $1,400. Um, that was seven years ago. And he understood that he could um, only use it if there wasn't a high tide. He had no intentions okay. of ever filling it or putting any fill into it. Um, and. Uh, you know, it, it was, that was the only reason it was ever decided. He just wanted to use it if, when, at times when it wasn't wet. He wasn't planning on using it when it was wet because you couldn't. And that's probably what would happen again. Uh, anyone that would park out there during these last storms would have lost their cars. Yeah. Uh, but he yeah. never intended to fill it. And it would never the intention of the board to fill it or to add any fill to it. Um, and um, that's all I've got to say. Well, as people mentioned, I did own the house that is two north of this, and my father owned the one that was right next to it. Um, that land back there has always been used for parking. Uh, all the way back to, I can go back to the early 60s, 
uh, when Lupo's was a restaurant, it was a summer restaurant only, and, and the people parked out there longer than you were, so, chief. <laughs> not, not as far as 1638, though. Uh, but that area was always used for parking. Uh, matter of fact, the, uh, if you look in the land behind 599 and 597, uh, all that land has been filled out there. And who filled it in? The state. Yeah. When the state put the uh, metal seawall up on front, which now is a cement wall, they filled that whole road out. The, the, all that fill they took out to put that metal wall in all went behind those houses. Why they didn't do behind this one, I don't know. But both both uh, both uh, north and south of this piece of property was definitely all filled in by the state right. back in the in the late mid to late fifties. So again, I don't know why this wasn't brought up. But it's always been parking for at least since the early 60s. So uh, this is the first public hearing on this. Gus, yeah, I have one more thing yep. I'd like to say. Mr. Yeah. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I'll get, oh, that's, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, Regina. I, I don't know. Yeah, you probably forgot about me. But I, I just did. wanted to say, yeah, I'll let one you... thing. This is the first public hearing. But is, is Mr. Flynn there tonight? Um, yes. Yes, he is. Oh, okay. No, I just said no because I can't see. Right. And I just wanted to say I pretty much married what you just said, how the parking lot has always been parking back there. And I do, I sympathize with the Conservation Commission, and I do agree with them that we do need to really look closely at what we're building there. But at the same time, you know, the old Lupos building could have been left intact. And would that mean that he would have been grandfathered in if he left it? No. No. The same way? No. No. No, one of all right. Well, anyway, he took it down, and he's going to make a nice new place. So, I just wanted to say that I would be in approval of this project. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that um, you know there is something to think about here. As long as we're talking, and the conservation commission is talking all along there. Um, uh, you know, I've been there for over fifty years, and. Um, one thing that does happen with all of the properties along the marsh is that, and I don't really know scientifically why it happens, but I do know that from the marsh coming up and going on your property, it sucks your property down. And that is one reason why all of these properties, and it's not just uh, uh, the, the property uh, that's where the, the 595 Ocean Boulevard, I'm sure that gets water on it too. But it's always been developed there, so there's no way that I would think that you could stop any future development from that piece of property um, at all, because it's always been developed. It's always been, uh, I can't remember if it was paved when it was Lupo's, but I, <clears throat> I know that it's, the building itself was built, and the building was on town land. So I believe that uh, building, actually, a, a little piece of it actually sat on this land that's being discussed tonight. Mm. But he never expected to be filling it in. But I think in the future, we have to take a look. And when we have um, that, the study that's going to be done with $100,000, I think this is one of the important questions that they have to um, discuss, is uh, what's going to be the rights of the people that live along Ocean Boulevard? They have their properties. They need to be able to fill them in. I know that at one time when my property was, uh, my parking area and everything was put in, uh, when you used to look at it, it uh, was totally, uh, there was no slope to it. Now from that water coming up and sucking up onto my parking area, my parking area goes down. Like I'll, I'll never forget probably 45 years ago, I dropped something down and I noticed how fast it started to go down towards the marsh, even though it looked like it was level. Today, it doesn't look level at all. Yeah. And I'd, I'd hate to be uh, just like if I owned this 595, I would hate to have my ability to uh, rebuild there affected in any way. I wouldn't expect that from my property. Um, mm. This other piece of property is you know what we're discussing here tonight but i do think we have to make sure his 595 ocean boulevard is definitely protected he should be able to do what he wants to with it and, and charlie preston made a good said point. the same thing you know we we need to be able to fill in some of the you know we're either going to have to fill it or give it back because mm -hmm. the tide is going to rise so if we don't fill it 
it, the water is going to take over at some point. And every so. single condo that's been built on Ocean Boulevard, all the ones that are to the south of me and all the ones to the north of me, every single developer came in there and put in a boatload of fill. Yes, they did. And right. I, because my property, but I'm talking about the properties that are developed. I'm not talking about this other piece of property that doesn't, that's never been developed, which is what we're talking about here tonight. Right. But I feel that um, just because uh, 595, the buildings come down and um, he should have the ability to do what he wants there, just like every single one of those condominiums. But the other piece of property is something different. That's what we're discussing here tonight, and this is the first hearing. Right. So, again, this is the first. Anything else, Regina? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So, this is the uh, first hearing. Yeah. Yes, Mary. Could I just clarify? So, we're talking about the second lot where the parking is proposed. Correct. That's there's tonight's, never been any fill. Yep. Yeah, there's that's tonight's focus. Correct. He's probably okay. going to have to put fill at this 595 because th that's what it takes to okay. be uh, competitive with but the what people that are beside it. This, what this public hearing on is the back piece of property. What is the address of that? Is it, it, it would be. I guess the rear a. of 595. Rear, probably. Because it's not, there is no real address. address. It only comes up as a, yeah. there is a driveway that goes to that, that goes down between the old Lupo's property and the condo ne next to it. Yeah. That, there's a, 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 a common driveway that's yeah. there. Well, what happened, if you look at those condos next to it, the history of this will show that those condos got together and they bought the lot. Uh, there was another lot back there, I believe, that they ended up buying and they never really wanted this piece, evidently. There was there was actually four people, that, four yeah. different pieces that owned that part. Yeah, so they, other people bought it. They use it for parking. It's probably been filled in. But evidently, this piece was so low they didn't want it. Yeah. So, so now we have to go to a two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks, and we will have the second public hearing on this, uh, the same piece of property. Mm -hmm. So if there are no other questions, I'll close this hearing at <laughs> 7.32. A great turnout, Mr. Chairman, though. A lot of yeah. interest. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So next we have a second public hearing. Oh, my goodness. This one is 9 Dover Avenue, map. 104 lot 203 release to the town owned deed restrictions on formerly leased land the provision of the deed from the town to which the relief is requested is in paragraph 4 which restricts against premises being subdivided although the lot is not going to be physically subdivided this is i believe the second is this the second or first this is the first, first. Okay, so I'll open that up. Is there any public here willing, wishing to speak on this? Anybody in the public willing to speak on this? Seeing none, I'll bring it to the board. Mary Louise. Yeah, the information is, is asking uh, to uh, remove the language referencing the subdivision of land that's apparently a current deed restriction Correct. And, and it says the grantee will not erect any buildings upon the premises within seven feet of any boundary line nor shall the premises be subdivided all outbuildings and sheds other than stables or garages shall be connected with and attached to the dwelling house stable or garage on the lot so we hold this until we have a second hearing. Well, you act, actually, you have to have three, I believe. Uh, two hearings and then a meeting, right? That's right. Okay. So, so this, this is, is the, the first, first hearing. hearing. Okay. Regina, you have anything on this one? I'm good, thank you. Jim. This one was, was recommended both by the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission. Yes. That's what they voted on their uh, meeting to recommend. Okay. Kirk? And I have nothing. So, unless there's nobody there from the public who wants to speak on this one. We will close this one at 7.34. Good. Public, public comment period. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak? Stand up. Give us your name and, and your address, please. My name is Rick Bonin um, at 739 Ocean Boulevard. 
Um, I wanted to bring to the attention of the board a concern I have over Article 43 that was approved at the last town voting. Um, this is regarding a fire lane on the south, uh, south side of 2nd Street. Um, our house is on the corner of 2nd Street and, and Ocean Boulevard. It was made a condo and an additional building behind that on 2nd Street um, erected over 30 years ago. Parking for the uh, tenants, I'm an owner, has been uh, alongside the southbound side of 2nd Street for more than 30 years continuously. Uh, when the town uh, adopted putting in fire lanes in all of well, uh, 1 through 19, um, I contacted the, the town and the chief of police came out uh, to, to my home and I asked him about parking where, where we've been for six years as owners, uh, continue parking in this space while there is uh, a mark of the fire lane. He approved us parking adjacent, uh, uh, parallel to our house, close to the house which keeps our vehicles out of the fire lane. Um, Article 43 says there are seven spaces on that southbound side, which is factually incorrect. There are three, if you count the two, that our property has been using for more than 30 years. On the northbound side, there were five parking spaces where the proposal is to move to the fire lane. Those five parking spaces have been diminished to three in 2017. One from uh, the owner of 741 Ocean Boulevard who added a garage to their property this year and expanded their driveway, uh, furthering a curb cut which took away one space. The two properties um, uh, south, uh, west of 741 uh, in 2017 added a driveway again, taking away yet another space. So there were five uh, on the northbound side and there were not seven on the southbound side, as this article indicates. Um, for us, again, it's been parking there for 30 years. We purchased the property knowing there had been continual parking there. We have approval from the, the chief of police at the time that it was not uh, um, compromising the fire lane. Um, recently, um, we've had a, 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 a new neighbor on 741 and corner of 2nd Street that have brought the police to uh, 2nd Street four times this summer for concerns over parking. Uh, our neighbor did park in our space that was partially uh, our property and the town's property, the street, uh, and refused to move for my wife. I was away in, in Atlanta, uh, brought her very upset. Anyway, police came, refused to move his vehicle until uh, the police demanded uh, that happen. Also on the corner of uh, Second Street, the street light, which I believe is owned by Unitil, was uh, removed and put in a, there's a, a decorative uh, LED lantern on the corner of that street that is much lower than the, than the street light that had been there for numerous years. There's also the cross over to the uh, entrance to the beach right there, and it's not as well lit. Um, we were not notified as abutters, uh, nor were we notified um, as abutters of this petition. And additionally, in this petition that was uh, voted upon, uh, none of the 37 signatures, two of which are crossed out, one of which is a duplicate. None of those are immediate abutters. None of those addresses are within 20 addresses of 2nd Street. And there's no other mention of streets 1 through 19, which have similar challenges with narrow uh, streets and parking that extends outside. Anyway, it's a hardship for myself and my family. The purchase we made six years ago for this property, my neighbors who've been parking along this side of the street for 30 plus years, so I'd like the, 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 um, the, the, the council to take into consideration the hardship this presents and the actual need for this, for this change. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak public comment? Go ahead, Mr. Zanoy. Yeah, Jerry Zanoy here, 16 Presidential Circle, Hampton. The marsh pipe leak. I, I would recommend to the board that a state qualified sewer subcontractor be on the site when that excavation occurs. Somebody who's been state qualified in laying the pipes, and creating trenches, knows how joints are put together, etc. This will allow for an independent and objective analysis as to the root cause of the problem. If this turns out to be a joint failure, there are various types of joint failures and more than a few, few root causes. We need an experienced eye on the scene before any excavation occurs, as the excavation itself could disturb the scene 
and mask the true root cause. The last reported cause of failure was subjective in nature, in my opinion. Contractor placing a rock under the pipe and forgetting to take it away, and it broke the pipe. If the town had hard evidence to that as being a fact, it would have taken or should have taken the contractor to court and argued that a latent defect existed which caused the failure in our costs and pursued them accordingly, and that did not happen. In addition, it is improbable that that occurred as it would have taken three or more people at least to have erred. The person who put the rock in place and forgot to retrieve it, the inspector and or job supervisor who are supposed to walk the line, looking for such violations before the covered dirt is put on, and the specs are very clear on this, no rock bigger than two inches should be anywhere near that pipe, six, a half a foot away at least. And the people putting the covered dirt in place and raking it in place accordingly. At least three and perhaps five, six people would have had to not see that. It's improbable to me. The root cause is simply an allegation and not a fact. And yet people speak to it as a fact and it's in the paper as a fact, which is wrong. We had no proof of that. We've had storms of late, and we even had an earthquake in February the 15th at a 2.7 on the Richter scale. Who knows what may have caused this break. If a rock is the culprit again, we, we need as our first step a rock profile done on both pipes, either sonar-related, ground-penetrating radar, or sonar, or airborne radar. We know, we have to know what that rock profile of that marsh is. I tried to dig a hole two feet down in my backyard at about two feet in diameter. I pulled out 30 rocks. I have a photograph. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Yes, sir. State your name. And my name is Peter Buongiorno. I live at 737 Ocean Boulevard in the corner of 2nd Street, and I like to comment on the parking again on 2nd Street. Are you, you have a hearing, um, um, an appointment with us tonight? No. Okay, go ahead. We do have that issue yeah, go ahead. on the agenda. Well, I, w I wanted to point out and bring to the attention of the board that this whole issue, in my opinion, is that it's been made into a personal conflict between the new resident of 741 and myself. The issue is he does not wish me to park on the public street. And ever since he's moved in, back in June, we've been butting heads. And I don't understand what the issue is because I've heard a lot of stories and a lot of things have been said. But again, as Mr. Bonin spoke to earlier, it's a hardship. I mean, you know, you get, you want to have family and friends come over and they have to hunt and find a place to park. His, in my opinion, his goal was to push through this petition and claim a ha fire hazard as a disguise for his own personal agenda. And as Mr. Bonin spoke earlier, to the best of our knowledge and who we've spoken with, there's never been and there is not now a hazard or any problem with the fire lane. So it's, well, he pushed through this petition, I think, and I feel under false pretense and stole a lot of votes from a lot of voters in this town. And I think if people had known the truth, they probably would have voted, voted in another way. But again, you know, my opinion, this is, I mean, we've had, we've had our words and I've had to call the police several occasions to have them come down to my home because to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, sometimes this man scares me. I mean, he's just out of control with the things that he throws up in your face. And Mr. Chairman, I don't yeah. think this should be allowed. No, I, mean, I think it's completely wrong okay. that yeah. this well, man is talking like this. This is completely I, wrong. We're not allowed right. to do this to All people. right, I apologize, and I'll change the subject and just get back to it. It's a hardship, the parking. We have none, and his proposal was to eliminate all the parking on 2nd Street. And... Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to talk as a town resident. He was 
Rick Griffin, 529 Ocean Boulevard. Yes, there is a, there is no parking for this property. That's uh, when we talk, get ready to discuss it tonight. I went and I met with um, J um, the town planner. The two lots on the side where these cars park are not parking spaces. They never were parking spaces. They're not even big enough to be parking spaces. They have to be nine by 18 feet and they're not. The parking spaces for this property are on the front that they use as their front lawn. But to me, it's for, to let people sit here and disparage other people is not what public uh, comment is about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow Mr. Go right ahead. Griffin, if I may. As a 54-year resident of Hampton, I want to comment because I think the public was deceived in that article that was put together. I personally would have liked to have had much more information on it. That's the problem with some of these private petition articles. And I'm sure, and I, I intend to ask the police chief um, about the problems in this area when he comes up to talk to us later on. Residents in this community should be treated equally. They should have equal access to parking or streets or whatever is out there and they should not be uh, forced into situations that deprive them of their rights as property owners. Anybody else from the public? That goes for both sides. Seeing none. Announcements and community calendar. Mary Louise? Nothing under that. Sir? Regina? I'm good, thank you. Jim? <laughs> uh, just where the heck is spring? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not going to find it this Bert? week. No. <laughs> the only thing I have is uh, I got a call today from our, um, oh, Ellen Lavin. She's the treasurer. Uh, treasurer. Uh, I got a call from Ellen's husband and Molly Lavin was at the uh, White House today doing the Easter egg roll. Oh, the poor And I, I, I hear they found the, uh, the New Hampshire egg. So that was, <laughs> so that's, so Max, if you, uh, I got a phone number if you want to call him and talk to him. So uh, that was uh, something there. And uh, congratulations to Molly and her family for, uh, for being there. So that's all I have. Approval of minutes, March 19th, 2018, public session. I'll move them. Second. Move. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay, unanimous. Consent agenda. The original warrant yield tax levy. Certification of yield tax assessed tax year. Release of the current use taxation. New land lease, 21 F Street. Discharge of a mortgage. 217 new veterans credits. 217 new disability credits. 217 disability credit. 217 elderly exemption. Entertainment licenses for the Ashworth, the casino, and Sea Catch, Charlie's Tap Room. A request for a no objection for outside seating of service of alcohol for Aces and Eights uh, Casino and Pub. That's it. Do I have a motion? The motion. Motion to accept the consent agenda. By Second. Rick. Seconded by Mary Louise. All those in favor? Aye. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, Regina. Uh, no selectmen's representations on boards and committees. <laughs> we have uh, the cable advisory committee. I'd like that, Mr. Chairman. Jim. People would go along I'll with I'll make it. that nomination. Okay. Second. All those in favor? So, Aye. Jim. Uh, Capital Improvement Program Committee. I'll nominate I was on Mary this Louise. committee before. I'll do it again. Our, Regina wants Regina. it. I'll nominate Regina. Second. All right. All right. Any opposed? Regina, you have it. Municipal Records Committee. Yeah. <laughs> I'll nominate uh, Rusty. Thank you. I don't think they have any meetings. 
They don't. <laughs> I'll, <start with> <laughs> I'll accept. Recreation and Park Advisory Council. I'd like Jim. I'll nominate Jim. Thank you. All right. Second. Any, any opposed? This is Jim. War Memorial Committee. I'll take it. Oh, good. I'll Correct. second to have Mr. Gr uh, Griffin. Okay, that's the one. That's all the committees we actually have. But we have a little school? problem, though. Uh, is there a school one? I don't even no, know if there is. No. Not for us. Yeah. We have a little problem, Mr. What's Chairman. That? Um, planning Board, it says Mary Louse Wolsey. Sometimes people probably say that, but I'd like you to put an I in my name if you would. We can do that, I'm yes. sure. I'd rather not be known as Mary Louse. Very good. You've got to have some. <laughs> you got a little, a little levity somewhere. Fun with Town this. manager's report. Uh, oh, no, I'm uh -oh. sorry. Yeah. I've Oops. skipped over the whole section. I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all going to leave. <laughs> well, we would like the chief to stay a little longer, but uh, Chief Sawyer, police up, departmental update. Oh, I don't get that one. <laughs> What's that, respect? No, stay oh. a little longer. <laughs> yeah, well. Good evening, and this is going to be our first quarter update 2018. General overview, our personnel full-time, current staffing level is 35 sworn. It's 35 now due to the vote that we received at town meeting adding that additional uh, SRO position. In January, Officer Timothy Galvin retired after 31 years of service to the department. We congratulate Tim on his retirement, and I'm happy to report he will remain with the department as a part-time officer. In March, in March, part-time special officer Robert Delato was appointed as a full-time officer and will attend the 176th New Hampshire Police Academy commencing at the end of this month. The process for selecting two school resource, resource officers is underway. One position is to replace Matt Robbins, who, Robinson, who will be transferring to the patrol division at the end of the school year. The second position is to fill the position that was voted upon at this year's town meeting. A conditional offer of employment for a full-time officer has been made to a member of our part-time ranks. This position is to backfill for the new SRO position. Our part-time staffing, our current staffing level is 25. That's uh, probably our lowest we've seen in uh, my career. We currently have 11 new officer recruits in training scheduled to come to work for 2018 summer season. The department will be testing for part-time officer applicants on Saturday, April 7th. After the written test, successful applicants will move on to the physical agility test. At the conclusion of the physical agility test, successful applicants will be invited to an oral board interview. Those candidates who successfully complete the interview will be given conditional offer of employment and begin the next phase of the hiring process, which includes a thorough background investigation, polygraph examination, and psychological evaluation. Anyone interested in testing can register online at hamptonpd.com. Civilian personnel. On March 9th, the Hampton Police Department, along with family and friends, gathered to unveil a plaque at the entry of the prosecutor's office memorializing Masha Hess's contribution to the mission of the department and dedicating the prosecutor's office in her memory. Department offer operations. During the first quarter of 2018, the Seacoast has been hit with multiple nor'easters, yep. which have caused issues from flooding to power outages. The level of flooding and down wires was labor intensive, not only for the police department, it also put significant strain on public works and fire and rescue personnel. The level of coordination and cooperation amongst the departments greatly enhanced our ability to open roads and return power as quickly as possible. I'd also like to highlight the assistance and the efforts of the New Hampshire State Police and the New Hampshire Department of Transportation during these recent storms. During the first quarter, two major events were successfully held. One, the first weekend in February, Special Olympics of New Hampshire held its annual high school plunge and penguin plunge, raising funds for Special Olympics athletes to compete in the summer and winter games. On March 25th, the annual Eastern States 20-mile run came through the beach with runners from around New England participating. Tragically, four overdose deaths were investigated in, the Hamp in Hampton during the first quarter of 2018. The Patrol Division and Criminal Investigation Division continue to work diligently with our local, state, and federal partners to combat the opiate epidemic the region has experienced. The department continues to have an officer assigned to a regional federal task force to help combat this issue. 
The department has continued with regional efforts working with the Portsmouth Police Department, Greenland Police Department, and Seabrook Police Department to form a Seacoast Region High Intensity Drug Intervention Team utilizing grant funds from the New Hampshire Department of Safety Law Enforcement Opiate Abuse Reduction Initiative. On March 15th, the department participated in a school safety forum sponsored by SAU 90. Hosted by Superintendent Kathleen Murphy, the forum was well attended with an open exchange regarding the challenges of school safety. Another school safety forum will be held at Winnicott High School on April 11th at 6.30 p.m. This forum is sponsored by SAU 21 and hosted by Superintendent Robert Sullivan. Training. Beginning in February, the New Hampshire Police Academy Part-Time Officer Academy began being held two nights a week in the training room at Hampton Police, uh, Hampton Police Department. In March, the department hosted the FBI Leader Media Relations course. Department use of force training has been ongoing during the first quarter of 2018. We will begin our spring firearms training shortly. Public annou announcements on our website and in local media outlets will, outlets will be made with more specifics. Uh, this is one we're very proud of. Uh, in February, we were notified that the Hampton Police Department was selected as the recipient of the 2018 Storm Tom Stone Leader Award of Excellence. The annual award was established to recognize a member of the association for outstanding achievement in promoting the science and art of law enforcement management. The award is on permanent display at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, myself and Lieutenant Cadiz will be traveling to Birmingham, Alabama at the end of the month for the uh, conference to accept the award. And we have our activity, uh, calls for service. And again, I'd, I'd remind the board, these are first quarter numbers, so some of the percentages may look dramatic Keep in mind, they're only the first quarter numbers compared to the first quarter of last year. Calls for, set, per, uh, for service are up 1%. Motor vehicle stops are down 4%. Arrests are up 12%. DWI up 36%. Ugh. Drug offenses down 2%. Incidents reported up 12%. Offenses up 18%. Felonies up 78%. Parking tickets down 24% <laughs> and accidents down 4%. Again, I know some of those numbers look dramatic, but if you look at where those occur, uh, I'd say felonies pretty pretty dramatic, but it's 27 last year, same time 48 this year. So that can be affected by one or two cases, significant cases. And I'll take any questions from the board. So, Mary Louise. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of, I, would you, would you uh, decode the LIDA? What the heck does that stand for? FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association. We uh, okay. partnered up with them starting back in 2007. We brought our first class. It is now considered the premier uh, law enforcement management uh, education that is on the traveling basis. The only other thing that I can think even compares to it is the FBI Academy in Quantico. Okay. It's L-E-E-D-A, but it sounds like leader when you say it, and it's got a different I think they, meant, it to, they meant that little symmetry oh. there. <laughs> okay. Um, as you know, the Town Forest article passed uh, on the warrant when we, ran, when we voted. Will there be a more um, ferocious <laughs> upholding of the uh, no shooting in that Town Forest? Well, and I hope I, we're going to get new new signs. I would have to disagree with your categorization that there couldn't have been any enforcement because there was no ordinance prior to the vote. So we have to consider an ordinance then? No, you, you, you have an ordinance. It was voted on and passed by the voters. Right. But prior to that vote, yes. there was no enforcement no, possible I, because there was I, no, I no ordinance that. in place. But now that we have that nice article in play, then we can... Uh, try to be careful so that nobody's getting shot at in the town forest. Well, I'm not aware of any issues where anybody's ever been shot in the town forest. Well, anybody forest. discharging firearms could have one go. But anyway, okay. But that's good. I'm glad we, we passed that. Um, I appreciated both of you being at the safety forum at the um, Marston School <coughs> last mm. month. But I think it's so sad that you have to stand there and talk about children sheltering in place in the school. Mm -hmm. What a, what a, um, what a terrible thought for where our communities are going these days. 
I Hi. couldn't agree with you more. It, yeah. it, it's sad that we have to have meetings like that, but this is the world we live in, and we have to be realistic about it. And I will say that I believe the town of Hampton, through its police department, fire department, are well ahead of the curve on yeah. the things that you're seeing nationally. Uh, I had the I've had the privilege of being appointed to the governor's task force on school preparedness Good. and safety. I was at a meeting today up in Concord, uh, and many of the things they're talking about and wanting to work on, the town of Hampton has already enacted. So I'm very proud of that fact, and hopefully we can get some some more good ideas to come out of it to make our schools just a little bit safer. As you gentlemen did a good job, and it, it was nice to see the gathering there, but it's a, it's a sad thing. I'm going to ask Mr. Chairman if the chief will hang in for item uh, number three under appointments, and that's that second street stuff, because I would like to be able to ask the chief for a little uh, um, wisdom. I can offer right now that I have spoken to the fire chief on this issue, and we are both in concurrence that we do not recommend any change from the current uh, current fire wing. Which um, this doesn't affect what's going to be discussed at the, with what Mr. Dumke is going to be discussing. There, part of the discussion is the fact that where that fire lane is, are they are not th uh, the parking spots for that home. They're not big enough. They're not on the uh, plan that's at the Rockingham County registered plan. The parking spaces for that house are where their front lawn is. There's I'm a raised wall there. Yeah, so I just we don't want to get the head of it. Well, I just yeah, want to make sure like to that we understand so that. In case we need clarification. Yeah, I'm sure he will stay here. So, anything else? Mary <clears throat> Louise? No, sir. Thank you. Regina, you have anything? No, I just wanted to say to the chief and deputy, thank you for everything you do. And also, I heard the safety forum was uh, very well received. Yeah. And I'm glad, Chief, that you're up in Concord on that task force. Thank and you. that's all I have to say. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, congratulations on the award. That's thank great. you. That's a big and thing for us. You said department, departmental use of force training has been ongoing since the first quarter of 2018. What what do you do? Just brief, <laughs> you know, not, not, don't go into detail. Just if brief. you look at a police officer's belt, we carry a number of tools. You know, and we refer to it as a tool belt. And many of those things, from handcuffs to batons to the to the uh, pepper and to the uh, the taser, all require certifications and trainings and updates every almost every year because there, there are Supreme Court cases coming out every day uh, on police use of force um, and we want to make sure that our officers have the most updated training we are fortunate that we have a great training uh, core within the department we don't have to send our officers up to Concord or to other locations we train in-house so that's the luxury we, we utilize that training room to the maximum that we can and utilize the people in-house so we're not traveling to do this that's good thank yep. you I just want people to know that because mm -hmm. Last year when you had that issue down at the, the beach, at the big crowd around one officer and stuff, yep. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's restrained from using force right away. It's, it's really through training, right? And he exercised, it, it that officer there. in that situation, all the officers responding exercised great restraint. Yeah. Right. Good. So thank you very much for all of that. Work. And I offer congratulations also. Everything looks good on your report. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Deputy. Oh, Chief, you guys do a great job day in, day out. You know, we've had a lot of um, storms this winter, a lot of high tides, uh, with icebergs floating on Ashworth. It's have been crazy winter. <laughs> it's been a crazy winter, and uh, your guys have been out there. And I know your, your department is not up to, you're up to the 35 full staff, but still, there's more hours in the day than you have mem mm -hmm. men to work them. Yeah. You seem to be running into that. Uh, I, I know we have one. One request from a person on this board that wants to review the annual employees of hours work for the Hampton PD. So you may be hearing from that eventually to come back. I don't expect you to answer that tonight, but that question is out there. Um, obviously, uh, somebody has some concerns. Those questions may be better referred to finance for the tracking of the out. Are you talking about the total hours in a year? I, I don't know what they, th this person is looking for, but they have asked for okay uh, a discussion on that so okay I, I was hoping that you would be here you're the person that makes the choice of who and when where why they work so in compliance it, with the contractual obligations we have correct <laughs> it has nothing to do with the board of selectmen no so it Absolutely has to not. do with you as a department head and i appreciate that that falls and under rsa 105 powers of police chiefs yeah. that was the direction and control of police officers so is exclusive exclusively the direction of the police yes, chief Mary Louise. i have one more quick thing 
Uh, I just want to say that I am uh, continue to be very happy because Deputy Hobbs smiles now. <laughs> I'm I'd like to say one more. We'll oh, we needed on. a little yeah. urge. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope that too, when we're sitting down and having some roundtable discussions, that we can talk about Ocean Boulevard and more of it being closed when there's uh, standing water. Similar to the, how uh, I understand Northampton and Rye closed <coughs> many parts of their roads. Mm. Um, I know that I was affected by this high water being pushed into my building from trucks that just kept going one after another yeah. after another. And I'm hoping that we can at least keep close off part of Ocean Boulevard. Mm -hmm. That's good, Rick. At certain times when yep. the tides are high. Yep. Rick Stable. Sure. Any of the legislation that went through last this this last year, did that affect the part time hours or anything? That has not been signed into law yet, but I, I suspect it's coming. Uh, the changes to the retirement system reducing uh -huh. from the thirty two hours a week that a part time uh, a retiree working within an employer that's part of the retirement system right now it's 32 hours uh, a week you can't exceed that you're not supposed to exceed that <coughs> <coughs> they're now talking about making that an annual number of 1300 hours if you exceed 1300 hours the maximum you can go to is 1600 hours and the hours between 1300 and 1600 that you would work the employee, I believe, would be had to pay a stipend of 3% to the retirement system and the employer a 5% stipend wow. to the retirement system. So those are the changes that primarily could affect us um, because we do have some of our part-time officers that are retirees that are also working. Uh, we have one retiree who works for us part-time as an officer but walk, works for Winnicott High School uh, during the school year. So that could have a potential effect on that individual and anybody else that has two jobs within the retirement system. Mm. So that would not be good for us. These are experienced people uh, that are critical to our operation, particularly when we're at such low staffing and we have a lot of people without a lot of experience. We count on these folks to kind of guide them through those first summer or two with us. So I hope it, I hope better minds prevail on this one, but we'll see. <laughs> Talking concrete, Chief. <laughs> Alrighty, Chief. Uh, just one other thing, the animal control officer, the only thing I would highlight on that is you, you may have seen the uh, article on the snowy owl that we rescued from the marsh. Uh, they've named the owl Hampton, and Hampton is doing well. We're still a little bit underweight, but we hope at some point we're going to have a release that we'll be able to photograph and have uh, ACO Palmazano up there as part of that. It was a pretty... The original picture was great. I don't know why it didn't get into the paper. Um, <laughs> But I'm sure we'll get another photo opportunity when Hampton gets released back to the wild. Mm -hmm. Well, as always, thank you for your service. Thank you. And you would request that I wait for this next year? Yes. Just okay. Stay by just yep. in case there are any questions for you. Thank you. The next one is Chris Jacobs, Deputy Director, and Jen McHale. <coughs> DPW to hear talk about the Force Main update. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Jennifer's been running numbers <laughs> almost daily, and it is, has been a moving target. Uh, I, a week ago, I predicted it was going to be $100,000, and she tells me I hit the lottery, but only by a few cents, so I'll let her fill, fill you in with that. I do have, I don't know if you guys have seen them. Um, what's being handed out is just sort of a memory that summarizes uh, where we are at. Uh, we have contacted um, the excavation company that we worked with last time, San Marino Trucking, as well as maybe mats. Uh, they are the people who supplies the matting that goes on the marsh surface, as well as the bridge components uh, that will help us get over the side mill. Here you go. <laughs> Passed the ball out. Thank you. you. We'll find out. Um, so the mat company, uh, maybe mats, they'll supply the mats, and uh, this time we will need one bridge to get over to the failure location. We've also contacted Ted Berry Company. Ted Berry Company supplies the video inspection services. Uh, this is something we did not get a chance to do last time, but we have every intention of doing this time because we are not dealing with um, the bends in the line. We should be able to get 
a good 300 feet plus in each direction uh, to see what we can see from the inside. Again, uh, Ted Berry also comes with a back truck that will help us try to get any uh, debris uh, that's within the pipe that's collected. Um, and the video inspection will let us see the condition of the pipe uh, from the interior out. With that, we'll also have Crisco Company out there. They are a septic hauler. Uh, some of you may remember last year seeing them actually drive out on the mats, uh, go out there. They provide sort of uh, the pumping service from the excavation hole. This way it doesn't go back into the marsh, but right into the truck uh, and carries uh, any of the residual away. Putting that all together along with Wright Pierce, who is our engineers, who will be out there. Um, they will be out there from an engineering standpoint uh, to help us evaluate the pipe and its condition, as well as from a wetland standpoint, because we will need an emergency authorization from NHDES to even do this work. Uh, we'll need the wetland consultant to help uh, when we are on the other end of the repair, uh, file the dredge and fill permit that will be required uh, with the state. We are looking to work with the tides uh, so that they're not working against us. That puts us at a excavation or map placing date on April 9th. So that's one week from today. We expect that it will take us a day and a half to two days to put out the mats and the bridge to be actually excavating on the third day, which would be Wednesday. We hope to be cameraing on Wednesday uh, and if uh, time allots as well as the decision making process either repair on Wednesday or, or on Thursday uh, once the pipe is repaired our intention is if we find that it is repairable and that the video uh, inspection says that there's nothing significant on either ends that we would repair it we would pressure test it to show that it is holding pressure again uh, and put that pipe back into service um, DES has requested to be there, uh, so they will be on site most likely throughout the entire process, along with Chris and myself and our engineers and all the other companies I've just mentioned. Um, we do realize that there is an unknown here, and until we can actually see what the failure is, uh, that's when we'll finish making the decisions. So before you are the costs, uh, these are estimates. Um, basically, all these services are on a per day basis, not knowing how long it will take to do each thing. The total does come to $99,480. We are asking that you authorize us to make the repair and to allow Fred to sign any of the proposals uh, moving forward to make that repair. Uh, we will be paying for it, uh, unfortunately, out of our sewer maintenance line account. Um, it's a sewer line and we'll be maintaining it so that's the only place to get the money at this time uh, one other thing we're expecting one other person to be out there uh, meeting with uh, your attorney uh, Mark Gerald he suggested um, that we do hire a third-party independent consultant um, to come out there so it wouldn't be my opinion it wouldn't be DES's opinion it would be a third party um, the right. engineer we have an engineer that uh, uh, his name came to mind he's, he's uh, semi-retired um, a wealth of experience in this area I think he's worked for the state and in private practice um, I don't know if that's been confirmed that he's been retained yet but um, you know it was a comment made earlier um, to bring some if you will other perspective to this issue and I have no issue with that and uh, really do welcome it so um, we are going to be looking at it from that perspective um, the other p reason for having that third party is if this does move forward into a legal realm uh, it's not my opinion if in, in that regal only in that legal community it's uh, someone else's who's not vested to either either side so uh, we don't have we don't have that particular cost covered yeah, in that here is not included um, in this cost. and I'm not sure whether that comes out of legal or if that comes out of my one of my operating lines it, it if it resolves the issue and brings some clarity to it I have no problems one way or the other paying 
report out of the uh, public works uh, sewer repair line. So having said that, um, yeah, we're, um, question was raised earlier, you know, we're, uh, we're not expecting anything different than different in the way of accessing it. Uh, uh, Selectman Griffin, uh, if I can quote him, said, you know, we, this will be our second rodeo. Um, so um, we know what we're we're in for this time. We know uh, that we, why we have to uh, to do it. Um, the other question is why are we limiting ourselves to one week uh, after the 16th of April that we're going to be in a tide cycle where the tide would come in. Um, there wouldn't be enough. Uh, we don't. Wouldn't, we'd have no way of securing the mats. They'd literally f get up and float away. Um, it'd be a bridge uh, bridge that would go somewhere where we couldn't control it. So. We have a defined period of time that we have to get this done. Any questions, questions from the board? Yeah, I think I, I ran this by you earlier. Those flow meter things, I forget what you call them, the little yeah, no, it's flow meter. doodles. Yeah. And you uh, our, to back dedicated on what our, you find. Yeah, little. our agreement with the DES was um, prior to this whole thing uh, evolving was that we would come to them by April 30th with a uh, way of putting a dedicated flow meter on, if you will, the plant side of the force main so that we could track the flow. Uh, we tasked Wright Pierce with, there's two or three ways of getting it done. We tasked them with um, preparing that memo and submitting that by the 30th to the state detailing uh, what the flow monitoring would be. Um, I can't say that I'm totally in favor of it because it was the actual pressure test that found this defect. Um, I'm not sure a flow meter would have found that. Um, you know, it's um, your, your bathtub either holds water or it doesn't. In this case, our bathtub didn't hold water, i.e. the pipe. And um, it literally caused us to go look for where this potential defect was. And we found it. So it w wouldn't have been, I'm not convinced it would have been able to find it with flow metering. But uh, I won't argue with that with the state. If that's what they want, that's what I'll put in. And the flow meter, um, another question, is it a waste of money? No. I can, if I don't need that flow meter in that location in the future, I have about 10 other spots I'd like to put it, uh, other areas of town where we would like to distinguish what our particular flow is and, and um, be able to handle that so that it's, it's a worthwhile investment. Thank you. That's good. Regina, or anything from you? Um, no, it looks like that we're pretty much just waiting until we uh, can get down there and see what the real problem is, right? Correct. All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Jim? I know you're waiting for the tide cycle. Does the weather mm -hmm. bother you at all? If, 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 if the ninth, if it comes in as, as inclement weather or anything, I mean... The, la the last time we put out the mats, we had rainy drizzly. Um, area. I mean, they can work in that. Uh, we wouldn't want, obviously, any unsafe condition. That's something we'd have to work with from a wind standpoint. Yeah. Um, these are construction companies, so they're used to weather. Uh, we were very fortunate the day of the excavation last time where we had sun and, and no winds were able to do it. Um, like any excavation project, you can still work in the rain until it starts causing a problem and then you have to shut it down. The flooding would, uh, yep. you know, tide, incoming tide would be the, our biggest a big problem. concern. Yep. Yeah, because uh, for people that don't aren't aware of this, we already discussed this quite a bit this evening at 6:30. Um, one thing that we didn't mention at 6:30, and we haven't really mentioned it now, is I hope that you're uh, going to be enlightened a little bit about that sand. Uh, That's, the, I think, the reason for doing the cleaning the pipe and video yeah. inspecting. Trying so to really see where it came from. It's going to be from. interesting if you can come up with some conclusions about that. But yes. thank you for all you're doing, and I wish everyone a lot of luck. Thank, thank you. you. you know, Make a mo motion that they... Okay, hold on. Oh. I, think, I think it's good that you, uh, you're you doing a couple of things a little different this time. Mm -hmm. yeah. One, you're going you're gonna to camera both sides of that pipe. Yeah. Two, you're having a third-party yeah. certified engineer coming in to do that. And we don't have to hear from others like myself who sometimes can be armchair engineers but uh, that happens so uh, I think both those things are very good 
Yep. Jim, do you want to make a make a motion that we uh, authorize them to go ahead with the repairs and, and the expenditure and have Fred sign the uh, contract? I'll need to waive that. the purchasing policy as well. Yeah, I apologize. For that. I should have said that. So do we need two motions, or can we put that in one motion? All one, one motion. motion. Yeah, and so we have the purchasing that. policy and, and accept the, yep. the bids that we have. Yep. So, yep. motion by Jim, seconded by Rick. Rick. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We learned Unanimous. a lot from um, from doing it the last time, and I, I think that illustrates that it wasn't a waste the last time. No, certainly. There's a lot to be learned, and who knows where this will take us in the future. And Thank you. Know, you. When we presented this to others, uh, Jennifer presented this down in Boston, uh, the engineering community was um, paid a lot of attention to what uh, our experience was. And um, they were amazed at how quickly we got it repaired and back online, but also um, that this can actually be done. Um, so, um, before we let these nice people leave, may we set up an appointment with Chris and Jen on a, uh, an upcoming agenda fairly soon? I have questions. I'm getting a lot of questions on Article Nine. Article and, Nine was already passed. And so no 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 but there yes, are ramifications yes yes, yes. No, it's been there are ramifications on that, that article has been passed it yes. was brought up before you were on the board and it passed and we're going to move forward with article it's up 9 to but, the chairman but moving, I'm not through yet but there are costs associated with going for, forward on that uh, Mr. Jacobs was kind enough to spend a little time with me last week there are especially that ornamental lighting is a uh, we had an explanation of that from from Jen. Yep. Came in, um, explained the whole thing to us. Explained what we, ornamental lighting and we, is. We, and we it was not an extra the expense. cost. I am talking about. It was not an extra about, cost. It's passed. I don't think. I, let's move on to what we. No, can no, move no. On. We need to understand, and the public needs to understand the cost. And I want to know the cost of the uh, oh, the report that you got from the utility um and i that hasn't why don't you go and meet with them on your own i met with him that's already that's not but back in yet is it you need to understand as a board what's we going do on understand. Understand. we do understand no there you, you don't ways. understand the cost okay. and Can i haven't move i can't put subject. my hands on the subject is moved. So. no the subject is not moot you need to understand the cost of doing that confounded going to meet with you. yourself Mary Louise. thank you we we heard Mr. from Chairman. Yes. Rusty, I'm um, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think one of Mary Louise's questions is, I understand the article's been passed, but the ornamental lighting, the reason why she's bringing that up is because we're going to add an ornamental lighting, which I think was explained by the town manager, would actually save the town money because it would be our lights, and we wouldn't have to pay Unitil. No. Uh, Mr. T is that no. something, Mr. Town Manager, that sounds right? That those would be our lights put up there? If it was necessary to put up lights because the lines were going underground behind the buildings, there would be no way to have street lights on that road unless that we, we own them or unless we put a pole line down the road through the utility. That's the way and it then, is. Okay. Yeah. And but we, we all don't understand that. know whether we have to do that or not. I, we don't have to go over it again. We move on. Yes. No, we're, no. We're moving on. We're moving on. Yes. We're moving on. Now, Mr. Chairman, the we're, public we're has an on. interest here. We've already discussed And the it. facility, the, the report that you got for us from Unitil. Mary Louise. You, you met with me, Mary Louise. Yeah. My suggestion would be that you come in and meet with Jennifer and I. And um, Okay. There again, this is one of the projects The projected she's costs on there were huge for... But as I said, the that that ha that's two different Warren articles. Bunch. Article nine is all a lot about doing the drainage, right? And yes, correcting right. the sidewalks down there, correcting the pavement down there, and correcting the lighting down there. And when we have final design drawings and bid package, we will be back before this board to obviously right. have Correct. it approved. And okay. that's what we do not have those design drawings done at this time. Thank Correct. you. Thank We're you. basically unprepared and don't right. have sufficient Right, but you do have that report, and I'm going to be asking for when the, they have what it, cost, they'll have it. What cost us? What it Early cost us? Drop to have it, it, please. Stop interrupting me. You're wasting when our I, time. I, all right, all right. Enough is enough. When you have, I would enough like the cost of that report. Call me, Jen, when you have.
time. It and will I know, be after I fix the marsh pipe. I know you're up to your ears. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is that it? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Escape Thank while you, you can. <laughs> we have Ralph Demuke. Dumkey. Dumkey. Sorry. Article 43, parking on 2nd Street. I'll make sure she gets that. that. Yeah. So my name's Ralph Dunkey. Uh, I own the property. It's you can sit at the table. Oh, I can sit down. I um, own the property at 741 Ocean Boulevard. Um, I'm not big on social media, but I understand um, um, there was some information put out that I don't live there. I'm not from around here. Um, whatever. Uh, I've been in the area for 40 years. I started a construction company 30 years ago and um, 20 years ago moved it to Seabrook, New Hampshire. I have four kids. Two of them graduated from Sanborn in Kingston. Two of them graduated from Exeter High School. Um, I own a company called Waterline Industries. We build water and wastewater treatment plants for cities and towns. We employ about 100 people in the area. And um, the, we rented 747 Ocean Boulevard for three years before we bought 741. Um, the, the issue really um, in front of you is, and I know some people don't want to hear it, is that it really is a safety issue and a liability issue for the town to continue to allow people to park in a fire lane. Um, if you open the first um, the drawing, which is actually a copy of the um, what was filed as a registry of deeds, you'll see that the um, um, the building was put into two condos in the year 2000, um, and um, there's unit number one, which um, I've highlighted in pink, and the parking areas for unit number one. Um, are um, also in pink. So one of them is in front of the building on, on Ocean Boulevard, and then the other one is behind um, the building um, um, heading towards Kinks Highway. Um, the other uh, unit, number two, has two parking places that were approved. Um, one is actually where, um, and you'll see later in some pictures, there's now a gas meter. Uh, there's usually also a barbecue there. And um, there's also the air conditioning units are there now. So it's virtually impossible to park in what is supposed to be the parking area. The other parking area is the orange one that's on Ocean Boulevard. Both of the ones on Ocean Boulevard are used for um, lounge chairs, grassed areas, landscaping, et cetera, instead of the parking that was approved by the planning board. And as um, it was mentioned earlier in the meeting tonight, it's a requirement that each unit have two parking places. Um, presently, there, um, and if you look at the yellow uh, lettering in the parking area for the pink one, it says that once this is turned into a condominium that basically those stone walls will be taken down uh, to allow for the parking to be there. The blue area that I highlighted is where the um, residents of unit number uh, two park now illegally in the fire lane. Um, what happened when this first became, I think what the problem was is that for many, many years, oops, I'm sorry. For many years, the owners of 741 uh, and number four and six, um, Second Avenue, um, were very part-time. They live in, in this very southern part of Connecticut. They were up very little. 
and so the parking was not really a big issue. Um, they were up very, very little at a time. Um, so um, if you look, I also have some pictures um, of what happens when, they're, when the parking <coughs> becomes an issue, and you can see the cars. The first one is pictures of the cars parked in the fire lane. The second picture shows what happens when you start to have um, cars parked on both sides. Um, and what you'll see is that, especially uh, in the summer now, when we have all the surfers coming, there's campers, there's large vehicles, um, and you have people parking on both sides, uh, it can get very narrow and it will be difficult and is difficult for um, fire apparatus and ambulances to get down through that area. The next picture I have there is what is supposed to be the parking areas um, and are actually the landscaped areas that um, are being used for lounge chairs and items like that instead of for parking areas. One of the, one of the um, issues that I think is happening is because you actually have the the person that owns um, unit number one actually has four registered vehicles. Um, two of them are motorcycles. They have one car and one truck. And what happens is in the summer, um, the person um, doesn't want to put the um, motorcycles in and out of their illegal storage shed. And so they don't want to block their parking spot and they actually park on the street and the only time that they move their vehicle is when it rains which can be weeks at a time so that's the next picture of the storage shed with the, mo with the motorcycles the picture after that shows basically the same situation and then the the next picture actually shows where the pickup truck um, blocks the driveway from um, people trying to get out of and that you also have a similar view for the people out of trying to get out of um, four and six of second street um, it's virtually impossible to back out of the driveway um, because there's not enough clearance left and the, the last thing is a copy of the letter from the owner who lives like I said down in Connecticut um, and he's asking also that this um, um, fire lane be moved to the other side to make it safer. Oh. It's actually it's loose. Yeah, it's oh, you know what? There may have been an accident. Yeah, that's fine. I got. I can he's good. We got it here. Mary Louise, your papers are hitting the speaker. That's what's. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoa. I didn't have so many papers, I wouldn't be well, I don't, I think um, the, the other thing is, I just wanted to clarify too, was is that, um, you know, I, I never called the police. Um, when I found out that there was an issue with where these parking places actually were, I went to the Registry of Deeds, got a copy of this, made copies of it, highlighted it just the way that you see it here went and attempted to meet with the people to discuss with this and try and work something out. And um, they called the police on me when I tried to talk to them. Um, I did for a short time. All I asked was that the, the little white car be parked on the other side of the street instead of the big black truck. And that um, worked out okay for about a month and then it changed. Um, all of a sudden, the, the black truck was out blocking the visual um, for people being able to back out of the driveways. So I actually put a package together, which I delivered to the town manager's office, basically with all of this inf exact same information, asking for help, and I never got a response. Um, that's when I then went and, uh, and started with the Warren article. Um, and I don't think that there was anything in the Warren article that's not true. Um, the people at number four and number six, Second Street, um, spent the time and money to go and get the permit in order to put a driveway in. They've actually at sometimes had five cars in their driveway 
which on the street, if they had done it that way, there would probably only be able to be, as stated earlier, only two or three vehicles. Yeah. I don't think that people have to live around uh, <coughs> the area to sign a warrant article, by the way. That's, that's, a, that's not the way it is. Anybody can sign a warrant article for anywhere in town. So, you done uh, with that? That's pretty much it, yeah. All right, Mary Louise? For those of us who don't live in that area, um, it's kind of hard to get a mental picture. You, you brought the diagram. Um, where you have the visitors in summer, you have all that traffic. You have people competing for parking spaces, and in the pictures you brought, it does show that actually it looks like people are supposed to be parking on the sidewalk. It doesn't look to no, me No, like there's actually, if you look, you can see there's another line that shows a sidewalk. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't on the planning board in 2000, but you can see there's actually two lines there. One shows the curb. And then the other one shows the property line. But like the, right here, you got a sidewalk here. Right. No but, place to park that I can see. Well, and you've if got the, the stone walls, walls were removed. And the lawns. If, so basically, if everything was taken away from the front of those dwellings, you might have some parking spaces. I don't know who allowed the area to be configured like that. But so that was the only way they could get the condos approved. Supposed to remove them. That's never been done. It's. It, I don't know how anybody. It says even on the plan that they're supposed to be removed. I don't know how anybody can that's find registered. adequate parking spaces down there. Well, it's that's too the planning bad. board. It's too that you're well, on now. They yes, are the ones that made I, that. I will keep this in yeah. mind. I promise. But there's no parking for fire lane, and the sign is clearly up there. And um, parking fire lane tow zone. So I I guess people are surviving <laughs> how as best they can down there with parking spaces. But I don't know, other than rebuilding the whole neighborhood, I don't know how you're ever going to sensibly resolve That's this what has to be parking done. system. This it is a It seemed mess. like the easiest solution was to move the fire lane to the other side of the street and allow the people to park next to their house. It just makes more sense than having them park across the street and if they don't like it, then what, there's really not a hardship here. What it is is they're, they're obstructing other people's right to enjoyment because they don't want to obstruct their, their front yard and their, and their visual view. I can't tell on this where the fire lane is because I, I don't... I don't do too well, I guess. The with fire them. lane, Mary Louise, so that you know, right where is the where is. the blue, uh, that blue square is, where they're using for parking. They're parking in the fire lane that's there today. That's what the problem is here. But we the have blue to part is just a little. Whoops. That square there, that but is the fire, the fire lane. Wouldn't the fire lane be the whole room? No, the fire road? lane's right there. That's just one little bit. That's well, the fire lane. But I thought a fire lane is when you have a whole. It, that, that's Street. a pretty big area. It doesn't look well, it there. Well, it, it looks like a little chunk. Well, it is the fire lane and probably a little to the front of that. I mean, if you have to fire get fire lane. apparatus down, they're going to have to go down the whole street. Yeah, that's well, why they don't so need the cars parked there. That's exactly what the problem is here. But it just shows this. Do we have little, any more I'm, questions? I'm confused. Okay. I mean, I really, You're going to need right. to be, get, get a, a breast of what happens at the planning okay. board because this is what it's all about there. Jim? Well, somebody planned poorly. No, the people, it hasn't been All followed. All right, let's continue, please. Is the police chief going to talk on this? If somebody would yeah, like him to? Yeah, after we... Uh, I, okay, well, I, I have no question. We should have I, our discussion okay, first. Okay, I'm, I'm confused. I'd love to hear what the police chief has, so go on, Rick. Okay. Rick. Yeah. First of all, um, this is the area. Uh, this is the plan, and it says right on the plan. I met with the uh, town planner. He says that these spots in the front, those fence was supposed to come down. And so this is what I've gleaned out of the thing from talking to a lot of people. 
when the late there was a lady living in this house and she decided to break it up but she rentaled she did rentals there and she rented the places out and then she had them condoed so that someday she'd be able to sell uh, it off piece by piece which is what she did with the back also she owned the back section and uh, so at first when she was just renting the places she did not need to take those um, wall down that's out there in the front. Now when the new people came and bought, they should have looked at this and gone to the um, Rockingham County uh, whatever and look at the plan and they'll see where their parking spaces are clearly marked. The space on the side where they park today is not big enough for a parking space. Well, I would guess. And you'll find that out at the planning board where you're supposed to be making sure they're all 9 by 18 feet. These are not 9 by 18 feet. So the people are actually, when the car, if they parked as close as they could to their house, they'd still have part of their house, their cars, being in the fire lane. So that's what the problem is here. Then we were given other pictures that um, Regina submitted um, that showed these people have been putting yellow um, cones up that says I no that. parking. That's completely illegal at all times, everywhere in Hampton, to do that. And yet they've been doing it to save their space in the fire lane where they can park. Uh, Miss, they've also stated here tonight that they, Mr. Dumpke called the police four times. He just told you he never called the police. They are the ones that called the police. And, you know, when you, my question to the police chief is, when he okays people to park somewhere, does he make them a place to park that overrules the planning board? I don't think he realizes that, that those are not the spaces where the people are supposed to park. The bigger problem here on every one of these um, numbered streets is we have this same problem. Yeah. Street after street after street. And one of the big problems is, is everybody that lives there, because they want to have their own parking for when their friends come over, and I don't blame them, and they're entitled to do it, to park on the street. But they park on the street all the time. The fact that they are using their front parking spaces as a um, front lawn means they never, ever get to park where they're supposed to park. The back section, they've got a, um, a uh, garage there for a trailer to put motorcycles in. You know, I if you have that. motorcycles, you need to find a place to put them. You don't take your parking space. Uh, and many people are doing this. And in fact, down at the other end of the beach, they have these uh, trailers are in public parking lots on the street. And you can clearly see that they have it all, it lights up, you know, it's all hooked up to power and everything else. Um, that's basically not, you know, they're not using their own parking spaces, but I don't think they should be allowed to use the parking spaces that are in the fire lane. And I'm prepared tonight, I'm going to make a motion after we talk to everyone, uh -huh. uh, that uh, no parking zone uh, signs be put, it, put up there, even though it doesn't seem like they do any good because these pictures clearly show yeah. that people are parking where it says no parking. Right. And if Mr. Dumpke's house burns down because the fire truck can't get yeah. there, the yeah. town is going to be responsible. And that's the problem we have here. And that's what we need to really take a look at. Um, I did go to talk to the town planner. planner. What are those? Well, that's where they're supposed to be parking their cars, not motorcycles. Go rent a place up at Kenny Lassard's place to rent your motorcycles. That's why they have these places all over the place. Last you time can I rent. checked, you had to register okay. a motorcycle, too. So well, I don't know why you can't park it in a parking spot. Well, no. he can park it there, but he needs to park his car there, too. You can only park so many spaces, but it's up to him where he wants to park. But after talking to the building inspector's office, they say that these are definitely, where these people are parking, are not parking spaces. And that was from the um, assistant building inspector. The town planner says it is clearly not a parking space where they're parking. That's what we're addressing here tonight. And um, well, let's move it into the other side. Okay, of the well, I'm not though, finished, not Regina. Important. I'm not finished. You can talk after I'm finished. Um, the correct parking for this area is in the front yard. It's clearly displayed on more than one tent plan that is yeah. registered with Rockingham County. I got this one from Christina in Mr. Yeah. Welch's office. 
And I would like to address also what Mr. Dumpke said about the uh, lighting. <coughs> he didn't, I don't think you addressed it, no. but you were accused of doing something with the lighting. Any um, resident of Hampton can go to the uh, electric company and ask to do, have the parking, the lighting change. This lighting was, um, when it was first put up, was too bright for almost everybody. And uh, so, and I, I think that if the lighting isn't bright enough, Mr. Dumpke is willing to uh, work with these people. Well, you know, I was asked by the building inspector if I would, because there were complaints that the light was too bright. So I went and I got a dimmer light for it. But the, the other thing is too, is that because we there were all the wires overhead and everything else we we got the permits we went through the building department we we got we to with the exeter hampton and and we got all the approvals to get that in and to and to put that light up and and i'm paying for the power for that and not the town anymore where the town used to pay for it he did what what, what? people want to do down on um on lafayette boulevard he had all the the wires taken down because it makes it much more beautiful he can he evidently can afford to do that everyone would do it if they could so he did nothing wrong with the lighting um what light is it a front porch it's light no or it's the street, street light, light. A... anybody can change the street lights you can rent a street light you can have one put on your property if you want to pay for it but i'm, I'm uh, not trying to do that <laughs> yeah well some people do there's a parking like at little jack's parking lot there in the back the property is yours. and part of what i would it's like to on, comment it's across, here it's across from the is, blue what? Oh, okay. Because this is, I can't figure out from this. I've run a business for 45 years yeah. and I've never had enough parking. And I have to go and I have to rent from the abutting um, neighbors mm -hmm. and I have to tr treat them nice and I work with them <laughs> and they, we, have, we work it all out. Yeah. And that's what people need to do. They have to work these situations out themselves. For the police to be called in here like they've been called does nothing but raise everyone's taxes because they have to take so time out of their time way. to go down there. Mr. Dumpke's never done that. And uh, when you don't have enough parking spaces, it's up to you to find some more parking off site. So they have four parking spaces that people are not utilizing here. The one of them has that motorcycle trailer and maybe that's what they want to use, utilize it for that. There's room for another car behind there as you can see. There is the other parking um, space that is uh, in the tangerine colored uh, behind the blue. There's a parking space there that's big enough to be a parking space. But the other two parking spaces are in the front. That's never been done, and it should have been done, and that's what the problem is here tonight. Regina, it's your turn. Regina? I just don't understand what moving, if we're having a problem with people parking in loading zones or fire zones. I mean, it's like that North Beach is zoned like nowhere else in this whole town. I mean, it's been overdeveloped. There's no parking. Yeah. All right? Yeah. So if it's like that on 2nd Street, it's like that on 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th. Yeah. I see it every single day in the summer. It's like that down the main beach. People put chairs, trash barrels, cars, and they leave them there. Doesn't make it legal. I mean, it's, it's a town-wide issue, or at least on the coast of the town anyway. Mm -hmm. So if it's an enforcement issue, I don't understand how just moving the fire lane is going to do anything. And why hasn't it been proposed by a police chief or fire chief to do this before? I don't think well, that's the issue here. Well, I think Mr. Dumpke understands that the fire lane probably is <clears> not going to be moved. Okay. That's what the Warren article was for, and that's what we were here talking about. Well, we're talking about the parking spaces. These people are parking in the fire zone. <laughs> that's the big problem here. Anywhere Warren else, Hall. if someone calls the police, they should have those cars towed. Isn't that correct, Mr. Welch? A ticket would be applied, and if the car wasn't moved, it could be towed. These cars should be that are parking. Where, <clears throat> and, and the problem for Mr. Dumpke, why he's here tonight, he doesn't want his house to burn down when a a parking lot, I mean, a, a fire truck cannot pull down here because these people are parking in the fire zone. That is the problem. Okay. Mr. Welch. Sir. It looks to me like this one that's in question is this one in the blue. 
the top, but I guess the cars are parking. That's there. the fire zone lane. The, they're parking. Fire lane's on that side of the road. The fire lane is on, on, on the south side of the road. That's correct. The Warren article wanted it moved to the north side. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'd like to hear from the police chief, and he, and he had talked. He had talked to the fire chief, and the fire chief explained to me the same thing he explained to him. But that and being me too. That, I talked. That to being him. said, where this plan is been recorded, does the town have any liability to make them put those two parking spaces in the front? It's an enforcement action. Who would have to do that? Well. First of all, the planning board would have to come to the Board of Selectmen and say that the plan that's recorded in the Registry of Deeds that was approved is not in effect. They could ask the Selectmen to enforce that, at which time we would light, write a letter to the owner of the property explaining that they have to comply with the plan that's currently registered in the Registry of Deeds. Failing to do that, the town could take an action in court to force them to do it. Okay. What about the parking spaces? That's what's not that's, being addressed. And that's what I just addressed. If, yeah. if, the, if, if we no, have to You're talking about the parking spaces out front. Miss, All parking the parking, spaces. The, yeah, but something needs to be enforced, and this is what we need to ask the chief. Why aren't that's, they enforcing people not to park? I don't think he realized that it's the fire lane. These people have made it sound like that's their parking spaces if, when it isn't. If, if you're parking in a restricted zone, the police Which department. that's what that is. Okay, the police department can give you a ticket. And if you fail to move that within a reasonable period of time, they can tow and impound your car. But they refuse to give them a ticket, and they refuse to make them. Well, I can't the force them to give them a ticket. Well, I don't think I, they I don't realize. Why don't we and have I'm the chief sure come up here? Case. and We can ask him if he realizes that there are no parking spaces. And I want to ask him if he uh, outrules the planning board. Do you, uh. when someone asks you, uh, you don't tell people to park where it's not an approved spot. I'm sure. Do you? No. No, Rescue I wouldn't us. think so. No. I'm sure that you wouldn't. But before we go down the path here, let's talk generally about parking in the North Shore area. <clears throat> the issues you're talking about exist on all those side streets, okay? Before we start, I want the law enforced. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> I think you should enforce it. Okay. If I'm going to enforce it there, I'm enforcing it everywhere. That's good. Including businesses in front of Ocean Boulevard where people stop in front of businesses to drop off on a state highway. Yeah. Can't do it. It's fine with me. Okay. That's, and here's the part. Everybody comes in and I want this enforced. I want that enforced. Okay. If we enforce it exactly to the letter of law, there will not be a, a car parked for more than 24 hours on any side street in the town of Hampton. That's good. That's the way it should be. That's what uh, everybody have to, would like. Uh, no, it's not what everybody would like, Rick. I'll have to respectfully disagree with you. And we wouldn't have any room for all the cars we talk. We hear it here all the time, and we ask Mr. Welch, his cars are not supposed to be in a spot more than 24 hours. I Correct. think if that, that would be the way to go. I, I would be for it. But, I mean, the problem is here, how can you allow someone to park in a, in, um, where there are clearly signs that say no parking? Well, how can the people be allowed to park in the fire lane? That's because, what these people are doing. Because there is a question as to whether those cars were actually in a fire lane or in somebody else's right of way. That was the question. You've had the benefit of looking at all these documents and going over this. That would have been nice for me to have, too, because then I could come in here and, e and equally pound my fist Did about certain issues. Did you bring them down to the police? I gave one to the police officer uh, during and one of the I've never seen any of he's this. He's done what he's supposed to do. He's, he's, trying to do. he's trying to do it the right way. He wants to be friendly with these people. i got, I got to be happening. honest with you, Rick. What we're doing right now, is this really the right way to handle this problem? You're not, yeah, not parking in a parking lane. I think if we don't do what we're supposed to do, they're, they're having the cars. You can't see them. It says no parking in fire lane. Rick, we've them. been trying to manage this parking issue up on the North Shore for as long as I've been with this police department. <laughs> Maybe it's and time to stop it everywhere then. I, I'm all for it. So, Trust me. And if you think you have complaints now, <laughs> where do you get the complaints? Because what we're going to wind up getting into, okay, if you drive around and someday if you want to take the drive with me, I'm going to drive you around and show you a lot of properties that have encroached out into town Trust property. Trust me. That's what we need. That's exactly what we need to take care of. I'm all for it. And then, then be prepared to double your legal budget because to get that rectified <laughs> and going to court 
is Mr. Gerald won't have time for anything else and whoever else we decide to hire. It is well, a how do daunting you, task. I talked to the uh, fire chief, too. Mm -hmm. I spent about 20 minutes with him this afternoon, yep. and he said, uh, talked about being able to pull the, he, because of the radius or whatever, they have to be able to pull in there. Well, what he wants to pull in here, he would not be able to pull in here if these cars are here. From what he decided described to me, I wasn't privileged to the conversation. Well, he said he talked to you. We have talked, and yeah. the last conversation I had with the fire chief was last Tuesday after staff meeting, and we were both of the agreements that, as far as a public safety reason, I'm not going to get into what's deeded here and what's deeded there. That's not my prerogative. That's what we're here for, though. And even the fire chief said to me that we okay. could actually uh, move the um, parking, uh, we could move the, uh, the fire zone if, the, if we wanted to. But I'm not suggesting that's what we do. I'm suggesting we follow their advice. But I think if we're going to follow their advice, we need to make sure a fire truck can get down there. And the way it is right now, a fire truck can't get down there. I'll respectfully disagree with you. Well, uh, how we can allow people to park where it clearly says no parking, I don't understand. Okay, which issue are we on now? Whether a fire truck can pull down or the no parking issue? It's, it's, we okay, got to focus do you see the on no, one at no a time. Parking? <laughs> yes. Okay. How can you allow parking where it says no parking? Because parking is an issue throughout the town. I don't believe anybody's ever gotten a ticket in front of your establishment for parking and leaving on the highway. establishment up to because if you can ticket them all you want, I don't want them parking there either. My so point. don't blame me for what other uh, people Nobody do. blamed you, Rick. Yeah. I have <laughs> parking spaces in the back of my building okay. that can pull in. My point being is there's parking violations throughout the town of Hampton. Well, you know, we need to be enforcing the law. I respectfully disagree. I never said we weren't going to enforce the law. Well, I said we that's what we're here dealing with here tonight, the fact that these people are parking where they're not supposed to park. So let me bring this back. If we're not talking about the fire lane mm -hmm. and we're talking about where people are parking, then that needs to go to... It's, it needs to go back to the planning board. Their entire ability to use these pieces of property are based upon their requirement to be, obey what's registered in the Registry of Deeds, which was formulated with the property owner and the, the planning board. If that fails, the planning board can always call a public hearing, and they can attempt to remove their authorities, or they can force them to do what they have to do in accordance with the plan. That may require a court order, but they can be forced to do that. If they are, in fact, I mean, if you look at Second Street, Rick knows as well as I do, that uh, there's quite a swath of property either side of one of those streets that's grassed area or graveled areas that's town right away. Yeah. Okay. And, and we had to solve this problem on another street down there where we actually went out and find the corner bounds. And we had people who were constructing in the street. Yeah. And they, oh, yeah. It, we, we tried wherever we can to enforce this. What about the people on Ashworth Avenue that had to take the front of their buildings off? Same problem. Yeah, we've, we've made people take their buildings off. This is the, nothing the, new to the this The issue board. is, do you want to enforce the law the way the law is written, which is, it's a civil matter, it's not a criminal matter, Correct. okay? Mm -hmm. It's a civil matter. We can enforce that, and we can send notices to enforce it and give them a period of time. If they fail to enforce under... 67714, I think it is, okay, <laughs> then we can start finding them $500 a day until they do it. We just went through one where a piece of property was seized by the town for a penalty because they violated the law, and we took them to court, and we gave them proper notice, and we had a $750,000 lien on their property, which we now own. Mm -hmm. That can happen. I don't really particularly want to go there, but you, you need to get people to cooperate. There are ways to do that, and there are administrative ways to do that without involving the police department coming down and towing everybody. We just need to contact these people through the planning board and tell them they need to follow the, the ordinance that's written and they need to follow what's in the Registry of Deeds. Failing to do that, there is some grounds for which you could revoke the, reg the registry authority. So property. Mr. Dumpke should go and make an appointment to be at the planning board, it sounds like to me. Well, the, the letter should at here. least be sent to the planning board identifying this purpose and having them make a decision. They will then make a decision and transmit that decision to the Board of Selectmen and ask for enforcement. 
Mm -hmm. The selectmen then have the power under the law to enforce what's in the registry of deeds and enforce the, the ordinance. But so. until that comes from the planning board, we don't. Basically. Yeah. Except we have the for, ability to change the fire lane, but I guess that's not what, what we're talking about here tonight. We're just talking about enforcement. Yeah. Well, that's why it seemed like to me it was just easier to move the fire lane to the other side of the street instead of going through all of this. But if that if that's what's got to be done, then that's what be what's got to be done. But it just seemed like the easiest thing was just move the fire lane. It's there because both chiefs recommended it. Recommended it that way. Yeah. Mary Louise. But there's people yes. parking in it. That's the problem. Mary that's Louise. Able to solve. I'm, I'm trying. We have a problem because. <laughs> the beach as it was set up for summer recreation in the early part of the last century never assumed that people would have so many cars, motorcycles, visitors, etc. The beach infrastructure has outgrown its usefulness. Mm -hmm. It's too small. It's too compacted. There are no places to do anything. It's not anybody's fault. It's how the society has, has grown. We're, we're a different society now than we were in the earlier days. The only thing I can see at the moment, because I'm sure there are issues like this in other Everywhere. neighborhoods, if people can possibly try to get together, if the stone wall that shouldn't be there can be re can be removed if we can have a little flexibility as neighbors understanding that you're stuck in there like a bunch of well, the squirrels thing in a hut you you've got to figure out some way to try to have a chance to be civil and if possible you know park your motorcycles somewhere else or don't bring them to the beach or buy a different property or whatever. Well, when you're at the planning board, that's why you make a, um, you're going to be getting I'll petitions be that are going to make sure they have two parking spaces for every condo. Well, that's you, what these people have. You may have. not they don't be able to though. do that, Mr. Yeah. Griffin. Then, the there's, then you turn the condo down. That's what happens. Uh, that's fine. And I, I will have there's a wonderful time. There's too many condos. Okay, yeah, okay. so let's get back down. to the but whole situation. But this is a societal problem. It's no, not. No, it isn't, Mary Louise. Yes, it it's is. a planning board let's problem. Let's get back to the problem. The problem the problem is that we have some parking on the street that's not where it should be. The property has been um, plotted to have two spaces in front. They don't have them now. So I would suggest the plan this go back to the planning board. So if we, a letter from him, is that what you would think would be? Or from the selectman. Or from the selectman, and we can send him a letter to, to look at that piece of property. Excellent. And he should do it too and ask if you can be and on the agenda. We will ask him to look at the piece of property. It has not, nothing to do with the fire lane and which side right. it's on. Right. So the fire chief and the police chief both spent a lot of work, yep. a lot of time on dealing with the fire lanes down there on, on the numbered streets. Mm -hmm. and they came back with their recommendation and I have no plans on changing the recommendation of the police chief <laughs> or the fire chief right mm -hmm. uh, so we'll, we'll have to I would say can we have a letter drawn up to ask them to look at this not a problem and the planning board will notify I'm sure they'll notify uh, mr. notify mr. Dumpy probably will notify them also well that's fine too but we're, yeah. we're gonna send a letter from us yeah. to look at yeah, and the neighbors will be notified by the. And I will notify anyone that parks in front of my spit my shop. I never ask right. them to ever do that. That's not the point. Yeah, that's <laughs> well, not it is my right. point. I don't want them. You know, this is Sharky's the, the yeah. one that does. Okay, so we're gonna. She leaves the nursing will, home okay. and parks. So yeah. some, we will, we will send a letter to the uh, planning board asking them to look into it, and we'll, we'll have to wait and see for it comes back from there. They didn't tell you this went with your job, okay. did yep. they? Thank oh, you. no, no, no. You can do that. <laughs> Anthony Caro, Earthstone Contracting. Uh. <laughs> Good evening. Um, Anthony Caro, Earthstone Contracting. I hope this is Hi. an easy one. <laughs> this is so easy. You're gonna, it's even about the ocean. You're going to love this. Just say yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let him finish. I'm just asking for uh, an extension on my um, permit to park on the Placeco parking lot. 
just okay. for a month. Due to those storms we've had, we had like, yeah. I don't even know how many storms we've had in a row. Uh, I'm behind schedule. And I have like four other uh, properties. I need to just do some rock work. Some as simple as just moving the rock in front of their stairway leading to the beach. And also I talked to Chris Jacobs and I'm willing to volunteer my machine to move some of the rocks back into the, um, the dune area that where it got pushed back. Make so. a motion that we... Motion right. by Second Jim. I'll, yeah. Seconded right. by Rick. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. You know, Aye. Fire line, are you? That was hard. No. Wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. The so next part is Aquarian. 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 Yes. Oh, I'm looking at. Good. I was looking at the earlier one. So <laughs> good. I didn't have Aquarian there. So Aquarian's on this one. I kept looking also, and I said it's not on the agenda. Yeah. Uh oh, we got pictures. Okay. Media. <laughs> Multimedia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Chased you all the way back to the office. To see this. Yeah, just pull it up. That's good. You get another one. Thank I'll you, give, sir. I'll give to uh, Regina. Thank you. Well, good evening, Al. Ah. Do an introduction while our. <clears throat> there we go. So, you know me, I'm Carl McMorrin, uh, operations manager here for Quarion, also a resident of Hampton. With me tonight is uh, John Hurley. Oh, be oh, careful. Geez. Our, Fred, um, don't do that. Vice President for Water Quality and Environmental Management. John Walsh is our Vice President for Operations, and Dan Lawrence is our uh, Director of Engineering and Planning. And, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Walsh. <laughs> All right, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us here. Um, first, I'd like to express uh, my appreciation for the collaboration with town staff over the last, uh, say, about six months. Um, I think it's characterized by open communication and respectful challenge, which I think is beneficial uh, for the residents of Hampton. Uh, tonight, one of the things that you're going to be hearing about is an update on PFCs um, from John Hurley. And John can um, pronounce what PFCs are. Uh, polyfluorochemicals, and it's also <laughs> known as PFAS, as polyfluoroalkyl substances. That's Stuff fine. that you don't want in your water. Right. So uh, please know that we <coughs> take this issue very seriously. I know the folks that we've been working with in the community recognize that. We're following through on the commitments uh, that we made to town officials, uh, and that includes evaluating the level of PFCs in our wells, uh, evaluating the treatment to remove PFCs from the water uh, in our wells, and testing for PFCs in the groundwater in the region to gain a better understanding of uh, the potential sources of the PFCs. Uh, to that point, we're working in partnership with the um, state DES to test for levels of PFCs in private wells in Hampton and Northampton. And we encourage people to uh, join in this program. The testing of uh, the water in folks' wells will be or is free. Uh, and John Hurley, he's going to talk a little bit about how to sign up uh, for that program to get your well water tested. Uh, with that, before I go to John, we're going to hand it over to Dan to talk about some of the projects we're working on. Well, good evening. So this is uh, our agenda. Let's go through some of the main replacement work for the schedule for 2018. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the Mill Road Water Treatment Plant project. And then John Carlini will cover our PFAS data. And Carl will cover the Well 22 project. So we have a couple things we're doing this year related to infrastructure improvement, which is something we uh, strive for all the time. Um, this is a water main replacement that is on, um, <coughs> excuse me, on Mill Road in Northampton between Pine and Atlantic. Uh, New Hampshire DOT will be paving that road later this year. Um, so we are trying to coordinate, which we have been, and will be replacing <coughs> um, 
like everyone, we have a budget. <laughs> That's about 4,000 feet. We're hoping they'll get all that done. Um, we'll be out to bid with that work um, this week. And then so you'll see that we'll, be, we'll receive bids in a couple weeks and then start that project. So looking forward to seeing that, that done. That's a, an important piece of infrastructure, replacing an existing 8-inch pipe that has some um, break history. This particular slide includes a number of things. Um, so you have the various wells, well nine, nine of, going from the bottom up is well nine. So this is right on the Hampton, Northampton line, our mill road facility. Well, nine, 11, six, eight, a 20 and 21. One of the projects we're working on, you may be aware of, um, is consolidating <coughs> these multiple points of entry. So each of these wells, uh, nine, 11 and six, <coughs> come out into the distribution system individually and they connect to the distribution system and we're working on combining them. This has a number of benefits, and so we're working on a project, we call it our 9116 pipeline. It's that light blue <coughs> line, if you will, um, that's going to connect all the way back towards well 8A. That square, a rectangle right there, re represents schematically the new chemical treatment facility that we're trying to build. A uh, little <coughs> delay on the permitting side right now, um, as we're in court um, with an abutter just trying to resolve that issue. So the intention is to build the, uh, the, the pipe from uh, well 9 and 11 and 6. They're presently working on the piping within 8A, 20 and 21 right now, um, and have that ready for uh, before June 15th. That's our goal. So in, in, in addition to that, there's a, a uh, what's shown as yellow water main out on Mill Road right in front there. When we uh, originally designed the project, it was our understanding from our records, right, you know how records go sometimes, that we had an eight inch and a 12 inch main in the street there. We do have that 900 feet, <laughs> um, if you will, go down this, to the drawing. So we have uh, an eight inch piece of pipe only in that area, about 900 feet. So we're gonna need to put a new main right in there. Um, I'm gonna put a 16 inch ductile iron water main in there. So we have the capacity to move the water in both directions. Um, so you'll see that happening as well. So a lot of things going on. And then the Mill Road uh, treatment project itself, again, is ongoing with pipeline while we uh, just continue the process through the court. Any questions? We're going to. Okay, Rusty, okay if I asked a Go ahead. question? Okay. Oh, first of all, a comment. Ductile iron pipe, that's the pipe we're having a problem with in the marsh. So just don't get any stones under it. I'm assuming that the, the yellow line, because the map is a little tight, that's on the east side of Mill Road, right? Well, that's that, schematically that represented as being in Mill Road. It's We're not suggesting it's on the east, west, or the south. Oh, side. okay. So it's, but it's, it's, in the, it's in the road, in the right away. Okay. Um, do you, you have a time frame? When will this be? Will this be done this summer, or we'll finish the work related to well nine eleven six that blue pipe mm -hmm. and the yellow pipe that goes from uh, our our uh, new treatment facility out to uh, Mill Road and the piece on Mill Road prior to June fifteenth. Okay. A lot of work to do, but we have some important some important that's really important um, related to um, and what John Hurley he's going to talk about, and I'm going to move over to this. We presented this information a while back inside of our report that when we were evaluating different concepts or alternatives, uh, we looked at um, source selection and blending, um, treatment of just well six. So this is again for PFAs. We work on them PFCs. Um, and then scenario two is treatment for six, eight, a nine, and 11. And then obviously scenario three covers them all. So when you think about that, I'm just gonna flip back quickly. That's basically a <coughs> portion or all of it. Um, and it has to do with the concentrations, which John Hurley, he will go over in a minute. Um, one of the things we're doing right now, which was in our agreement, is we um, are working on what we, we call a bench scale test, mm -hmm. where we take the various different types of treatment media, not digital uh, music, but rather granular media, um, that can remove um, PFAs, and we're testing it in the laboratory to mimic what might happen with the treatment process. So we're in the process of doing that. That's bench scale testing. After we finish that, we're going to update this information, um, both our preliminary design and our costs. So that's the stage we're at. We expect to get information back from the labs, laboratories um, late May, with then, as I told Fred today, um, and those were at the meeting, 
we should have a draft report in June okay. with that information. So we're proceeding with there, with that information. Um, so we're right on schedule in our minds in terms of going there. So a lot, a lot happening right now. <laughs> it's a lot of things happening in June, but um, <clears throat> we're diligently working on them and we'd like the snow to stop so we can continue to work faster. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you about the monitoring that we've been doing and the results that we have found. Get the microphone over a little bit so we can hear. That's good. Thank you. Uh, so again, we're, we're talking about PFCs, also known as PFAS, uh, the occurrence in the wells that we have and the drinking water. Uh, we've done a lot of testing uh, since uh, June of last year back to 2014 when EPA first started studying uh, this issue. Uh, so these chemicals uh, have been used uh, for their properties to repel water, oil, and grease. And so they're found many places in commerce. They're found in everybody's homes, in rugs, in upholstery, in clothing, uh, in firefighting foams, et cetera. Uh, and so we're finding them in many places in the environment. EPA is in the process of setting an enforceable standard. They have, so far, they have set an unenforceable standard, an action level, a guidance level, and they've set that at 70 parts per trillion up here on the graph. This okay. graph uh, refers to uh, PFOA and PFOS. So EPA has set a standard, and, e and New Hampshire DES has adopted that standard for two of these compounds. There are several thousand of these compounds that have been manufactured. Uh, we have found 10 in the testing that we have done. The EPA has and NHDES have set standards for these two of the 10 uh, that we have detected. Down here on the bottom, uh, we have six locations in our distribution system, three in Hampton, two in Northampton, and one in Rye. Mm -hmm. Over here you can see uh, this graph represents our testing from August of 2017 to February of 2014, and the concentration levels go from zero up to 80. The highest concentrations that we have found Ooh. are less than 10. Okay, so the bottom line here is the, the guideline that's been set is 70. The highest levels that we have found are like one-tenth of that, the highest. In our, in, so this is the water that's being delivered to the customers. This is the tap water. This slide, similar to the previous one, but this now reports on all of the, the PFAS compounds that we have detected uh, since August of last year. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are a little higher because this is a, co a combination of up to 10 compounds, the same six distribution points. But again, you can see uh, the highest levels are just under 25 parts per trillion. Uh, most of them are in between 10 and 20 parts per trillion. So even if the standard of 70 applied to all of the PFCs that were detected, not just the two, that are currently uh, in the action level, the levels in our drinking water are much, much lower than that yeah. level of 70, okay? Now we're moving on to the wells. Th this is the testing we've done in, uh, in our wells. We have 16 wells listed along the bottom here. Mm -hmm. This group, uh, 9 through 2021, that's the Mill Road group. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's uh, uh, quite a difference in the concentrations of uh, PFAS it just in that one group. This next group here, uh, wells 10 through 19, this is the group that's on Winnicott Road. And then we have 5A in Rye, 14 in Northampton, and 7 in Hampton. Uh, so the uh, purpose of this slide is to demonstrate that with the exception of well 6, the water in our other 16 wells has low uh, total uh, PFAS levels, less than 25. Well, six, uh, we do have significant levels of total PFAS. You can also see from this that the way that we, can you go back a slide, Dan? The way that we're able to keep these PFAS, total PFAS levels low, now go back to the other one, 
is by uh, mixing these wells together. So these Winnicott wells are all mixed in the treatment plant, and uh, these Mill Road wells mix in the distribution main, and then in the, the general distribution system itself, the water mixes in the system, resulting in those levels. Another, another way that we keep them low is uh, we've had well six uh, out of service since August 14th of last year. So we have two different methods that we are currently using uh, to keep the distribution levels low. Mm. This map uh, shows work that's been done uh, to test the PFAS levels in the general area. So it does include the testing that we've done in our wells. Uh, this data comes from DES's database, mm -hmm. and that's comprised of several studies. So, like I said, the study that we have done on our own water, uh, on our own wells. It also includes testing that DES has done in, uh, and EPA have done in areas where they know there are known contributions of uh, PFAS to the environment. So, Coakley Landfill, for example, here's Hampton Landfill. There's a commercial area here in Northampton where there are known discharges of PFAS. But in addition to that, the third study is the one we are currently working with uh, DES on to test private wells in the three-town area yeah. uh, and see what kind of uh, PFAS levels we are finding uh, out there. And uh, the key, uh, the green is, is the lowest levels uh, and you see a whole lot of green on this map. Uh, our project uh, targets testing 50 private wells. Uh, DES is contacting residents, asking them to participate. DES is collecting the samples when they say yes. We're paying for the testing and shipping the samples to the lab. Uh, we have, currently we have 20 results out of this study that's aimed at 50. These uh, circles here are areas that we intend uh, to get uh, residents to uh, contribute their well water. The testing is free. Uh, so we have 30 more to go. We're hoping to get w uh, wells in these areas here so that we have private well results around all of our well fields. The uh, Mill Road Group is here. You know, we want to have testing all around the, the Mill Road Group. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, uh, next slide, Dan. So, we would encourage uh, the Hampton Board to encourage residents to participate. DES is sending out letters to uh, specific residents. When they get the letter, please participate. Even if you don't get a letter and, you know, you're in the general vicinity of uh, our production wells, um, we encourage people to call this number here, gets you right to DES and, and uh, you know, inform them that they would like to have their private well tested. And you can also do it online at this link here. Any questions on the monitoring? Any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, Regina. Mm -hmm. On the DES contact information, yeah. Is it possible, Mr. Manager, that we could get that put up on our website? Yeah, that's good. So if any, yeah. if any uh, people with private wells wanted to have their well tested, they mm -hmm. could get the information good. from there? Of course. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Regina? Anything I'm else? good, thank you. All right. Mary right. Louise? I have some questions. Are you gentlemen keeping up with the situation at Coakley? Because yes. there are a lot of challenges and so forth, and are you? Are yeah, I, you I read the reports. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We're nine eleven and six. You have the Hampton landfill. You have delineated down here um, on this one the areas of PFAS distribution. And when I met with uh, Carl last week. I, I think I left the printout of the Hampton Landfill mm -hmm. test wells. <clears throat> so he has a copy of that uh, to uh, look looked pretty good. Well, the reason we put this map together is that 
it shows that there's a lot of areas where there are little or no P PFAS, mm -hmm. and there's also other places besides Coakley that have high levels and are potential mm -hmm. sources to our well. So it, uh, mm -hmm. it's starting to fill in the picture. Yeah. Um, to be honest, there's nothing really confirms that Coakley has an impact on our wells at this point. Yeah, but, but we're, we're, we're continually data. testing the Hampton landfill, and so far we've, we've come out in pretty good shape. Um, when where, do you have a, an area of Hampton where you find more private wells? For example, I'm thinking in the northeast segment, it seems to me that near where I live, there are a lot of individuals who have private wells on their property. Have you any kind of account how many private wells there are in town? Uh, we've done quite a survey as part of the Well 22 project, which um, I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but we have tried to identify, particularly in the that sort of north central area where uh, wells 22 is located to try and pin down all the private wells as, as potential monitoring yeah, points while we the, do the pumping test. And speaking of well 22, uh, not so much in the PFOAs, but uh, salinity. Um, that is an area, the, the wells, and that's not online yet, 450-ish um, feet down. I know the neighbors are concerned about tapping into uh, salt hey, are water. Are you going to get to that? Or yeah, are we well, gonna go ahead. Well, I'll just jump to that, and then I'll, I'll skip back to the other thing I was going to speak to. So, yeah, well, 22. <clears throat> um, my right page here. Because <clears throat> that's a very wet area, but it's well, certainly low. Yeah, we got a lot of comments. We even had a public hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a pretty, uh, I think it was about a month and a half period of taking in public comments for the purpose of a uh, getting some sense of what the issues are, whether it's PFAS, whether it's you know, salt water intrusion, what, right. what effects there might be on private wells. So yeah. the result is pumping test protocol that we've, we've finalized. And really the whole point is to come up with a comprehensive data set so that we can make an educated decision on yeah. what uh, the sustainable pumping capacity for well 22 is, and sustainable meaning it's not going to have any negative adverse impacts on other wells in the area. Yeah. We get the data regarding water quality, so then we can make a judgment on what, what we need to do in, in the way of treatment. Because the availability of water there is great. You've got a good watershed It looks there. good so far. But the neighbors have been concerned about sucking the salt water in yep. where you went so deep. Yep, and that's what uh, one of the questions that we'll, we'll answer through this uh, pumping test. So. Mm. Uh, as I mentioned, we've surveyed a lot of the private wells in that area, trying to find uh, ones that we can monitor. We've I've got about 30 uh, on the list. Good. At this point, we're looking to doing the pumping test in mid-May, uh -huh. um, and that will produce a couple weeks' worth of, of data. While we do that, we'll be doing a whole batch of water quality samples for PFAS as well as some other stuff, so um, we think we'll have a pretty good... Um, Pulse on that in respect to salinity, one thing we can monitor uh, basically continuously is conductivity, which is a measure of the dissolved minerals in the water. And if it starts pulling in salt water, whether it's from the ocean or whether it's from some other deposit, mm -hmm. we'll know like within minutes, essentially. One, and one final question. Um, I can remember when uh, Chris John Walker, it, John Walker's property is up on Woodland Road, so that's a from where I live, but I can remember him saying that in the winter, um, he had a high water table there and he'd have to have a sump pump going. But in the winter when the water company turned off well six and the well in that area, then everything would be fine and dry. Are you, are you turning on or, or having more um, capacity for the tourist season, the summer season, and then do you shut some of the wells down oh, yes. up mm -hmm. season? Oh yes. Okay, so yeah. that uh, yeah. that would reduce any. It might, but we're pulling from um, considerable depth below what typically right. basement sump pumps are going to okay. going to see. So, just to wrap this up, uh, this is part of the large groundwater withdrawal permit process. It's a state state yeah. process. So we'll do the pumping test, get a lot of data. Uh, put together uh, a final uh, application report. Uh, there'll be another opportunity for, for public comment and uh, hopefully it'll result in an actual mm. uh, withdrawal permit by the end of the year. Wow. Okay. And then, so if we could go back one slide, just to talk, uh, sort of wrap up the, the whole discussion on, on PFAS. Um, we're moving into summer. Uh, 
at least there's some statistical probability it's gonna gonna warm up, right? Um, <laughs> which will increase demand, and therefore there's gonna be you know more frequent need to use all of our pumps, uh, including well six. And as John Hurley pointed out, you know there's trace PFAS levels in most of the wells. Um, and really, leaving six off is not gonna eliminate it, all of it from tap water. Mm -hmm. We're still yeah. gonna have those those trace levels. We're still in a little bit of limbo because the new regulations for these compounds are being discussed, but we don't know what the numbers are. So we can do our bench top test, but we really don't know what we're you know, designing to yet. Um, but what we can do is opti optimize our operations with what we have um, in order to minimize the PFAS level uh, in, the, in the tap water. Um, basically, it comes down by a combination of what we call source selection which is just choosing to run the wells with the lower levels of PFAS in it, leaving the higher PFAS wells, namely six, uh -huh. off yeah. until needed. So previously, before anybody knew about PFAS, you know, six would run 12 months out of the year. Yeah. Uh, and this regime is going to run maybe in two months and maybe only 50% of the time during that. So mm. essentially the load of the PFAS going in the system is a lot lower as a result. And then the combination, uh, the diagram that Dan showed showing those wells coming together, allows us to blend it. It's essentially a dilution effect. So even at that point of entry, we can minimize PFAS levels. We can keep them down to, to half of the current uh, 70 uh, HAL or, or less. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's how we're working with what we have to minimize PFAS um, in the distribution system. Any uh, questions, Jim? Yeah, no, I just have a comment because um, I've sat in on most of these meetings and stuff, and I think Aquarian has, has demonstrated a real commitment to clean water in Hampton. I think there are still lots of questions that we have on the P PFAS and all that, and what's the proper level and all that, and I think we have still have questions with Aquarian on other issues, maybe rates and stuff like that. But, you know, when they send two, two vice presidents out yeah. every month or so, and the uh, engineer to back up Carl, I think they've done a good job, and I think they've done a good job on testing the wells yeah. and trying to come up with a solution for it. So I think people can be fairly confident yeah. that, well, they can be confident that they're drinking clean water, and they also can be confident that with well 22, they're taking all the precautions that they need to take to make sure that that's yeah. a safe well. Yeah. So I, I, I want to thank Aquarian. I mean, it's not a big company that just doesn't care. They've shown commitment. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I would also like to thank Aquarian for coming in tonight and um, showing this demonstration. And uh, I have to, you know, we've watched Carl here for a long time. He does a great job communicating to the community uh, in the newspaper. He writes letters, and uh, they're always well received. And we appreciate Carl's commitment to the Board of Selectmen here. Thank you. Regina, you have anything? No, I just wanted to say, Meryl Wood, Rick, and Jim just said, uh, especially that we need to have confidence in what Aquarian's trying to do here yeah. for us. They're definitely doing more than anyone else in the whole state, yeah. as far as I can tell, has done, with the exception of our Representative Mesmer and her followers on this. And Mary Louise, to answer your question, the Coakley Landfill Group, they're fighting one of Mindy's bills, which are up tomorrow for a hearing. Right. Yeah. And the yeah. argument there is whether or not the state, per the consent decree, has the authority to change something, be whether because EPA, you know, whether the state has the authority to make what Mindy's bill wants made done <coughs> legislatively. So that's an ongoing battle. Some people think that cons the consent decree does leave that power to the state and others think that it does not. So I guess that's just another issue that right. they're going to have to get through. But the hearing is tomorrow up in Concord on one of her bills that she's yep. worked diligently on. And I just wanted to say that at the same time with Aquarian because I was at a Seacoast <coughs> Cancer Cluster meeting last week, and the EPA was asked a question that I found horrifying that they didn't know the answer right away. Because I knew if I asked John Hurley he from Aquarian, he would know. They were asked how many PF, PFOS or PFCs they are testing for, and they couldn't say the answer. And I'm pretty sure that if you asked anyone from Aquarian right now, they'd tell you it's 26. That's right. So that they're testing for. So I just want the public to know that we, uh, we're in good hands with our water quality and that, that Aquarian is doing everything possible that they could possibly do 
with the help that they're getting. And I just wanted to say thank you. Rusty, I just want to think. Sure. I want to just back up what they said also about having you well tested. That anybody can have their well yeah. tested for free. Yeah. And it's going to be it, it's a it's a real good thing for you to do. You'll know what kind of what your private well, what kind of water you have. So do it, please. And it's going to be on the website. And it'll be on the website where you can contact. Okay. Anything else, gentlemen? We're good. Thank you. Thank for you very much. Time. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm sure you enjoyed sitting through the parking thing. <laughs> <laughs> you always learn something. Nice you. Yeah, you learn oh, up the yeah. parking It's good to see it's you nice again. Nice to see you. <laughs> Did I let you coming up to Hampton? Yes. You're a brave man. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hurley. Nice, nice to you. Parking can be dangerous. Yes. So now we yeah, have the it there, I guess. town manager's oh, report. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you. Same thing. Oh, really? Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, members of the board. Oops. The last day to make application for veterans, elderly, blind, and other property tax ex exemptions, including the Hampton Beach Precinct tax exemption, is April 16, 2018. Please see the assessor's office for the required forms and information. All campaign signs from the March 13th town election are by statute to be removed last Friday, March 30th, 2018. The State Department of Transportation is beginning work tomorrow, Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018, on the Route 101 bridge over Tide Mill Creek. We understand that traffic will be channeled to a single lane by traffic lights. Speed limits have been lowered to 40 miles an hour. Please use caution and might suggest that during the morning rush and the evening come home that you use a different, uh, <laughs> different road to, to get through there because there will be delays. The last day to file for current use taxation or conservation restriction assessments is April 15, 2018. Again, see this is the assessor's office. Town and school reports are available in the lobby of the town office. I've been asked by the tax collector to tell you that uh, um, they're, they're, they're not going to have their, their office open on April 18th. They are required to take spring training with the state yeah. uh, for tax collection issues. There also will be a public hearing on Thursday, May 10th at the Marston School Cafeteria at 7 p.m. Yeah. Transportation grant for Route 1A, Hampton Beach traffic flow, parking areas at Hampton Beach, traffic and pedestrian safety. This goes with the reconstruction of Route 1A. Please go. Please listen. Please give, you the, give them your attention. It's very, very important that everybody understand what's going on down there. Uh, we, we have had some success in um, asking the federal government to clean up Hampton Harbor uh, with a dredge. Uh, our, our senator, uh, actually our entire congressional delegation, yeah. has in fact uh, sent a letter to the White House and to the Army Corps of Engineers asking for emergency funds to take care of Hampton Harbor. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Any questions for the town manager? Mary Louise? Yep. A um, couple of years back, Fred, I recall that we put on a little um, effort to get people to put numbers on their houses especially those of us who have been doing campaigns and signs and all that stuff, it's amazing how people just don't mark their houses. Remember we used to do with the fire department? If you have a fire, how are they going to find your house? And it seems to me that it would be very nice if we kind of nudged the public along to say, uh, please, if you don't have a number on your house now, go out and buy a few numbers and put them up so we can figure out where you are. This is kind of like old business. This is his report we're asking. Well, about this is that. the man. Well, no, it's not old business because we didn't talk about it before. And you're talking about well, what this is the I want to ask the manager report right now. Now, um, last week uh, when we were talking about the purchase by the Runnymede group uh, of the um, brewery, uh, you mentioned something about that we we would implement the um, we'd More vote old on the business. That's it. That's under old, that would come under old business, Mary Louise. Yeah, we're this is this is just report. on his report here. Well, it's something That's Fred's. How it works. It's Fred made a reference 
last week, and I just okay, want this is his report right here. That's One, why two, I'm three, talking four, five, about six. his re on his report. I don't see anything on there about that. No, that's why. Well, then I'm that's what old business comes that's up what next. I'm bringing up. All right. Right. Last, last week, last week, Rick, Rick made a suggestion to me. It was old business, it's and the way I said it's yes. That's been, right. And I went to old business. business. If it makes you happy, so, I have so an old business. So accept a suggestion. Okay. It's always been that Regina, way. Regina, do you have anything under the town manager's report? Yes. I just wanted to say thank you to our uh, federal delegation of congressmen and congresswomen yeah. and yeah. senators, and I also want to especially thank Senator Jean Jaheen. Yeah, okay. excellent. It. Jim, <laughs> I'm upset. And I Good hear report. what uh, Regina thank said, you. and thank you, Fred, for your report and thank for you, the uh, warning about 101. The only thing I got is on the uh, campaign signs. Oh, what do we do if they don't There's, remove them? We send Fred out. No, we send the building inspector out. He removes them and they go to the dump. L Lock Road and Winnicott Road has some. Okie dokie. I, I've been, if they're I, on private property, we won't touch them. If they're I think on public what happened property, is they we were had a lot snow snow on them. And the ice and, and then the, popping up. Yours did. I got one <laughs> yours out. All we can say belt. is just yeah. remember to all, all the you people that put signs them. out, please go around the way you put them out. It's and check and make sure that they have been up. removed. And if anybody finds any of mine, pick them up, please. I tried to pick it up earlier, and then I'll <laughs> Okay, so old business. Had... Mary Louise. Oh, my soul. We, all, we got old business. Fred, last week you mentioned something about that we'd um, vote on the industrial surcharge fee, which has been a sore point of mine. But I have no clue what the... Uh, description is of that fee and how you go about implementing it aren't we going to have <coughs> to research and then you know draft a motion I don't know what I don't know enough about the fee I know we need to levy it but all I found was a reference to the industrial surcharge fee on page 2-11 in the Wright Pierce report but I think if we get a better description Maybe even the right Pierce guys can tell us what what is it, what specifically is it, and what do you charge? And I'd like to get that figured out so we can vote on it before the new owners of the brewery take over. Well, it won't make, it won't make any difference when somebody takes over a business. They're going to be subject to the regulation. Okay. And and we do have right Pierce working on redoing the sewer regulations to bring them up to current EPA and DES standards, and mm -hmm. that will be one of the items that's worked on. You'll receive a complete report on it as soon as it's done. But the surcharge fee wasn't being applied to? It's not being applied because it's not in the regulations that were adopted back when we well, first had a sewer department. Yeah, right, so, yeah. that's, so we need we're, to update? We're working on doing that right now. Excellent. Yep. I appreciate that. Anything else? And, um, did dum did dum and the street numbers. That's it. Regina, do you have anything on the old business? I'm good, thank you. Jim. Yeah, I uh, I asked the tax collector today about Smutty Nose, and they were supposed to close on Friday, and they didn't close. And are we staying on top of that? I mean, yes. they they keeping us up to date yep. on that because they, she said it was $162,000 in back taxes that they owe. And we don't want the brewery; we want the money. Yeah, with the, that's right. So, <laughs> no, that, that that will be paid. Be okay. <laughs> and the pretreatment stuff set in. Well, those that's part of the regulations. All right. Yeah. All right. That'll be part of the license. That's a good point, Jim. Rick, that needs to be enforced at the planning board. Is that where that is? No, that needs to be enforced here. Yeah. Okay. Rick, do you have any old business? That's why we're um, watching. No, it. I'm going to bring under, up something under closing comments. Okay. I have a couple things under old business. Um, we have a wage study that's out there being done right now for all non-contractual employees. My understanding is it will be done in, the, in your hands in time for the meeting on the 16th. Okay, so. Thank you. That's great. And we had uh, a comment made last week about uh, confidential on um, some of the uh, our attorney's reports. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain why that happens? It's the attorney's opinion in some cases where he stamps something confidential uh, that he doesn't want it discussed until he either has an opportunity to take care of it in court or talking to the board okay. so that okay. no one else has access to it under the law. Okay. Thank you. 
That's good. Now we have a vote on RSA 4114A Proceedings 8A Atlantic Ave, Map 269, Lot 38A, for the release of a deed restriction number four, specifically the release of the will not erect any buildings upon the premises within seven feet of the boundary line. I'll make that motion. That's been given by the town attorney. Anybody want to speak on this first? So. Okay. Well, no, this is this is our part of the meeting. Well, so. I'm, the, I'm the property owner. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, okay. That's okay. That this has been both recommended by the planning board and the conservation commission, right? It has. Yes, so it both has. There is a there is a specific motion it. that council drafted for you. Yeah, the, that's the motion. The motion I want will to bring be. Forward. I move to approve the amendment to re, the deed restriction number four for eight A Atlantic Ave, map two sixty nine lot thirty eight A, to partially modify the seven foot of any boundary line deed restriction number four which formally read as follows the grantee will not erect any buildings upon the premise within seven feet of any boundary line nor shall the premise be subdivided all outbuildings shed and other stables garages shall be not connected within attached to the dwelling house stable or garage or lot line so that the now will, the same will now read the grantee will not erect any buildings on the premises within the setbacks prescribed by the Hampton Zoning Board, except for the extent to allow the Hampton Zoning Board of Adjustment a variance once said variance becomes final, nor shall the premises be subdivided. The remainder of the deed, restriction number four, will remain unchanged. I'll second that, Rick made it. Okay, all those in favor? I just have one. Aye. Okay, you got a comment? I just have a quick comment. I'm I'm getting very nervous about a lot of the properties down there due to the flooding. Other than that, I don't have a problem with this particular. All right, so motion. we have a mo motion seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Took a long I time. Thank long you for your wait. service. <laughs> 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 Anything on the new business? Ah. <laughs> Um, do we know when we're going to get a Mill Pond Dam update to, uh, from Chris? Uh, they've been a little busy with the, I know uh, they have, yeah. <laughs> the breach, but I can tell you that we have received all of our permits at this point from all federal and state agencies. Okay. So we are just about ready. We are working on the, um, the easements. Yeah. And once those are done, you've already approved the construction, so I'll be able to sign the contracts. And can we please, please have some photographic evidence as they build the dam? Oh, we're going to be going crazy with photographs. All right. Is there any well, question about that one? I, I love it. Regina, do you um, have anything on the new business? Um, I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Jim? Good. I, good. I had one more. Oh, go ahead. Do we have a date yet, Mr. Chairman, for the management reviews? Nope, we haven't. I was going to, uh, when would, would people like to talk about that? I just wanted the idea of a date that you want to do it. I, I, you know, we've had a lot going on with these past couple of meetings. I would say probably by the uh, first meeting in May. Yeah, sounds, sounds good, good to me. Idea. Sounds good? Yeah. Okay. Sounds so good. We'll I look, just like to have something yep. to hang our we'll, hat on. We'll look about. We'll look uh, for that roughly that first meeting in May to have a uh, a non-public to go over it with us. And, uh, okay. We'll do that. Good. Yeah. And, and, oh, did you have new business? No. no, I have closing comments. Okay, I have new business. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion that we start the ever every other week after Memorial Day. Uh, second. After, second. We have a motion and a second to start every other week after Memorial Day. Yep. So, any questions? Well, I'd like us to have more work time, but that's better than starting the first Monday in May. Okay. And continue it until the week after Labor Day. Okay. All right. How about the week before Labor Day? Well, his motion is no, the week after Labor Day. it's already made. I <laughs> so seconded it. I'm trying. All those in favor? Okay. Regina? Yeah. Yeah. Unanimous. I'm good. So that gives us an extra month. Okay. All right. So anything other closing comments? Yes. You know, like some you know, Mr. Welch just mentioned about that we are the ones to make sure that um, uh, Smutty Nose does follow through on what they're supposed to follow through there. Right. Um, and we had a public hearing here tonight uh, where we talked about uh, 
doing what the it's the conservation commission is you know they uh work with the planning board and we're prepared to follow everything that the uh, conservation commission and the planning board recommends uh, I don't think that we can pick and choose. When the planning board has already made uh, decisions, it's up to us to enforce them. I think we're on very shaky ground when we do not follow what's done and choose and be selective of what we're going to enforce and what we're not going to enforce. And one of the things that the chief, I talked to him out there about it, is something I have brought up here many, many times about all the different people that are putting in these driveways all over the place uh, and just paving over the right-of-ways. These things need to be addressed by the planning board and by the board of selectmen. And part of the problem, uh, Boar's Head is filled with people that have just, uh, and that's why the water comes draining down and floods Ocean Boulevard. That's just one. That's probably the worst, the best example of the most problem coming from one spot because it's a hill and the water just comes wishing, yeah. swishing down. But we need to enforce these decisions. People are turned down from having condominiums when they don't have two parking spaces. Every day the people, when people are go before the board. And these, if they don't have parking, they don't deserve to be uh, 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 condos. And uh, when they're putting a big project, they yeah, they ask for 30. And in the end, they get 18 because they only have that many parking spaces. And we cannot be selective. We have to follow what the rules and the regulations are. And that's why we're sending that back to the yes, planning so board so thing. they can make a plan. They can say, yeah. yes, it isn't done. And then it comes back to us so that we can actually They act make on decisions it. all the time. Make, they have yeah. to make that decision that, yes, we have a problem and they haven't followed the plan. Then it comes back to us, and that's yes. what we've asked them to and do. And we need to enforce and these things. Well, that's, I agree. that's exactly what I was going to say. There has to be enforcement. If we're going to go through this, then the planning board has to give us cause to enforce. So anybody else? Seeing none, motion for adjournment. I make it second. at uh, 9.51. <laughs> Gina seconded it. All those in favor? <laughs> Thank you, Channel 22. Enjoy your vacation.